We're back. It's time for the 2024 Urban Nerd Con. Join us in Atlanta, Georgia, April 26th to the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel. Special guests include the Sci-Fi Sisters, Underworld creator Kevin Grievous, from Nickelodeon, Giovanni Samuels, the Science Machine, Michael Green, from Spaceballs and Star Trek Voyager, Tim Russ, and from the Fairly Odd Parents, Gary L. Gray. What up, y'all? It's Gary Gray. Check it out. I need you to do something for me. Join me April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia for Urban Nerd Con. It's going to be lit. Okay. Our heroes, our villains, everyone's con. See y'all there. Visit theurbannerdcon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. All right, hello. Uh, welcome to an welcome to another live episode of the BCSN Sports Wrap. Uh, Brian Fulford and AD Drew here. AD, how you doing tonight? Happy Easter to you, by the way. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Easter. I, I am I am doing fine. And uh, Blue Jacket, don't even start it. It's too early in the show to be starting all that trash talking, man. All that mess. He didn't even start. Did he start with at least a happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day? Come on, man. You come nah, in. Nah, come he, in he, he just, he, man, he just came in, just slapped me in the back of the neck as soon as I walked in the room, man. Hey, he, he's asking about, I, I thought he'd ask about another sport. He asking about those rankings. I thought he would ask about another sport. <laughs> mm-hmm. No comment. The computer, the computer's been acting funny over the last uh, couple of months. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, but hello. Hello to everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day to everybody out there watching. Uh, hopefully, you and your family um, had a good Easter morning. Uh, maybe attended a resurrection service. Uh, you know, I, I have a tradition, Drew, that I've become rather fond of. I, I like to kind of wake up and... Um, and kind of get out somewhere in, in a good line of sight and see the sunrise on Easter morning. Um, you know, I used to enjoy maybe as a as as a youth, I, I used to enjoy getting up and going to sunrise service. That was one of the things we used to do on Easter. Um, so I guess in you know, I kind of enjoyed as a as an adult now, really trying to find somewhere where I can see the beautiful sunrise and. Uh, you know, just kind of thank God for everything and, and thank uh, Jesus for for uh, giving his life for us. Um, so I don't know. Brian, you got- why, I, why I can appreciate sunrise services, I never enjoy sunrise service, even as a youth. What? Because, yeah, now, now here's, here's the thing. If you do, if you do sunrise service, Possibly Sunday school and go to the house. I can, I can survive that. But <laughs> I know what you're about to say. 
<laughs> when I uh, as a, as a kid, I, my aunt would pick me up and go to church with uh, take me to church because mm-hmm. my mother went to her church. I went to church with my aunt. Just one of those things. It's just how it happened. You know how that goes, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and this was my this was my father's aunt. So is that is that your grand aunt or your great aunt or what whatever you want to call it? Mm-hmm. But anyway. How can I put this? Sunrise, Sunday school, regular church. Then, you know, if there was, then there was the Easter program after regular church. (laughs) (laughs) Did you you get some food in? Did you get a chance to eat something? Because them hunger headaches start to kick in, boy. (laughs) Yeah, you ain't, but God, dog, man. So that's, my disdain for the sun for the sunrise oh. service it's nothing against the service in principle of course of course yeah. nothing against the message I was, no, nothing against the i message. was traumatized as a youth for having to stay in church 10 12 14 hours on a sunday Mm-mm-mm. and then you know, as I, you got a little bit older wait hold up as you got a little bit older and if once I started like w- watching basketball as a kid, you know, there was always back. You remember basketball used to be played on Sunday afternoon. So you was going to miss that first game anyway. Oh, you mean during like the club season and things like that? No, I'm talking about doing it on TV. You were going to miss oh, that first game. Oh, it, it's still in, it's still on in the afternoon. I mean, they didn't start yeah, but, the but, game until like two o'clock. Right, but you know they used to start. To, uh, they used to start early. You know everything was done before sixty minutes came on, and the evening news. Came oh yeah, on. yeah, yeah. You had to be. It had to be done before sixty minutes came on at uh, seven o'clock. You had to be done exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then don't forget, I was in Central Time Zone, so that's six o'clock. Oh which yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> which really messed me up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know what's what's interesting is as as youth sports has taken over a lot of lives of parents you have tournaments basketball uh via friends who have kids playing volleyball uh that, that are having to get up at early morning and i'm, I'm like okay you, you drive like, three hours <laughs> yeah drive three hours or yeah basketball so i remember those easter tournaments and you know, you, you you got stuck scheduling those, and you I I you know you have to do all the weekends because you have the Easter weekend, you got the Mother's Day weekend, you got the Memorial weekend. All of those are club season tournaments. You know where because kids usually have like a Friday or a Monday off from school. Tournament organizers are like, well, hey, let's let's play a tournament during that time, and you know. Everybody's tournament is like, yeah, we got to play that weekend. I got some beef, man. With? Club organizers. Uh-oh. Yeah, I got some beef. Now, you know, especially nowadays, you know, they, when they send out the thing, because I still get the memos from my days of uh, coaching on the AAU circuit and uh, travel baseball circuit and all that stuff. I still get the emails, mm-hmm. you know. This weekend, you get that no games on Sunday uh, at the top of the email. Mm-hmm. Mother's Day weekend, no games on Sunday. Okay. But what happened on what? But what happens on Father's Day weekend? Oh, yeah, we gotta have some games on Father. Well, because they figure your fathers want to be in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it don't matter. Mama get the day off. Daddy get the day off. Let's be fair. I, I look. I want to file file a Title IX complaint against club organizers for not treating the men equal. All right, you you falling down <laughs> on? Uh... <laughs> I'm going in. A, I, I'm going in a rabbit hole all by myself. Yeah, I, you I are. I'm gonna know. let you. I'm gonna let you go down there. No, <laughs> no pun intended with the rabbit hole, right? I see what you did there. Uh, shout out to the folks checking in early. <laughs> there, there, there was definitely none because I didn't even catch it after you. After uh, see, you uh... I'm, I'm listening to you though. Know. Shout out to everybody listening. Appreciate you guys tuning in, uh, wherever you are, uh, whether you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, you might even be watching us on Twitter via uh, the Black College Sports Network. 
Twitter feed, or might even be watching us on Instagram. Hello to everybody watching us on Instagram Live. Uh, shout out to the folks who already jumped in early. Uh, of course, Blue Jacket for Life. Uh, appreciate you, Jimmy Mack, um, Demetra, Mary305, Chuck Hunt coming in uh, from, of course, Monroe, Louisiana. Tamara T, good to see you all. Coach Farasi checking in. Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day to Don't have one of your Langston guys on here later. Coach. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Coming up in the hour number two, uh, Langston University men's basketball head coach, Coach Chris Wright, is joining us. Uh, you know, we we promised, you know, we talked to Coach before the tournament, I believe. And yeah. so um, we get a chance to talk to Coach following the national championship game. Uh, what an outstanding game. We'll, we'll talk about the, the, the highs and lows of, I, I think we've all been there, Drew. I think if you coach long enough, you know, 20 years, I think both of us have probably coached some 20 something years at, at various levels. We've gone through both sides of what Langston went through on Tuesday night. You know, you, you've been through, the, the the comeback and the late win and you've been through the heartache of losing one that you probably should have won. And it, it just sucks that it was in the national championship game for Langston, you know? Brian, I still tell the story of the last high school game that I coached. Mm. And it and it still it still traumatizes me. Oh, uh, and anybody who listens to this show on the regular knows I am not a referee basher. But if there was ever a, a call that was blown, I won't say blatant, but a call that was blown, it happened to be in that game. Mm. And speaking of, can, can I take a can I take a point of uh, special privilege? Uh, sure. Uh, speaking of, because ironically, there is a uh, there's a player of mine who actually played. In that in that game for me, and she's gone on. She had a uh, four year career at uh, Langston. Mm -hmm. uh, four year started at Langston, and why did my screen just go all out the all out the way? I'm trying to share the screen. Give me a second. This was your, at your, this was in your last high school game that you're referring to, yes. right? In my last high school game, yes. Right. Right. There it is. And I hope that is that sharing there, Brian? Yes, uh, it is. I see it. We see it. <laughs> anyway, I just want everybody to take a moment and uh, it, log on to your Facebook page. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the link in the chat once I finish this talk. But uh, vote for her. She's uh in her first year as a uh, teacher. She was a four year starter at Langston. She played for me in high school, Morgan Hunter. She's trying to uh, win a competition uh, as America's favorite teacher. One of the oh, wow. prizes that she gets if she wins her classification is a trip somewhere out. Don't remember where the trip is, but uh, you can vote once a day for her. And if you make a monetary donation, your vote counts. Uh, you get one vote per dollar that you donate. So I have voted for her uh, daily. She's currently in second place. So I'm hoping that the power of my microphone will help get one of my players, my ex-players, over the top. And she is an HBCU alum everybody so just like everybody on tuesday night was pulling for langston i need everybody on sunday night to go vote for morgan hunter where and does she uh teach, where does she teach out of what what school district she, area she's in new jersey uh teaching uh i forgot i want to say she's just outside new york somewhere between new york newark new jersey uh that, that she's teaching it. I, I don't know specifically the city or the high school, but uh, you know, I just put the link into the uh, chat. So if everybody could uh, click on that link, vote for it, it. We always tell you hit the like and subscribe button. We got one extra step this week. I want you to hit the like, subscribe, and vote for Morgan Hunter uh, today while, while you're doing all that. So I would greatly appreciate it if you uh, would vote for uh, 
football a very uh very bright young lady i hope she gets into coaching one day because she was uh she, she had a very high, high basketball iq so don't know if that's uh in her future yet all right I, and what you may want to do is during the break create a, a short link of that like one of those bitly links because i noticed yeah. it's a heavy link and it may have yeah I didn't, off. I, didn't, I didn't even realize when i did it i'll yeah, see if you, i can go and create yeah you link. might want to go back later and, or just later and create a, a bitly link a short link okay um all right since since you've since you've taken us there with the point of special privilege i'm gonna i'm gonna lean on the public here um so we're we're half at halftime of this north carolina state duke men's tournament game uh now i have a plus 1300 future on north carolina state to make it to the final four just a little pizza money drew you know just a little pizza money um they are currently down six currently down six to do 27 21 they had a horrible drought in that first half where i think they were like one of eight or nine shots but somehow they're only down six so i need to figure out what direction do i go here to hedge hedge this bet you know again i only spent i'm being honest here i only spent five dollars but the payout i mean plus 1300 drew i mean come on now <laughs> that's pretty significant <laughs> that's gas a meal or two for the week right so uh i need to know you know do the the second half line is something like seven and a half or eight do you do you bet on duke do I just ride it out with NC State? Now it's down to four. I mean, you know what? What's what's your thoughts, Drew? Uh, quickly here, any any words of advice? You're not gonna get me to bet against Duke, man. Damn, all that's right. all so I'm you, gonna tell you. you. You riding with Duke, huh? Yeah. All you're right. You're not gonna get me to bet against Duke. All right. I I don't just I. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Chuck. I don't know. I don't know where there's value here. That's a foul. Oh my goodness! They called a travel. Jesus, help me! All right. So anyway, I just don't know where there's value on Duke right now. I mean, I don't. I don't like Duke at minus eight and a half live in game. I don't like minus five hundred on Duke. I, I just come on. Anyway, all right. This I see. This is going to be one of those games I'm going to have to keep my eye on during the next commercial break um but uh i'll be rooting for nc state and uh nc state so appreciate everybody uh getting in and voting as well uh also uh shout out to some other folks who jumped in keith from fangs up podcast uh who jumped in uh fangs up podcast will be uh keith will be on tonight i believe he normally does his show on sunday nights as well as thursday nights um appreciate you uh keith acknowledging the the fresh fade edwin moore jumping in good to see you edwin ea jumping in as well appreciate all of you for jumping in and everybody who's voting thank you guys appreciate you for voting and, and for those who did vote remember you can vote once per day so save that link uh contest ends i believe on the fourth which is thursday i believe so I need you to do that once per day between now and Thursday, if you would, please. I would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> now you're asking a lot, Pete. Now you're asking a lot, Drew. You're asking me to do this every day for the next four days? I mean, come on, Drew. You're going to have to send out a personal tweet every day for the next three, four days just to make sure. Uh, all I'm going to do is retweet her tweet. How about that? Uh, well, that's what you should do. That's what you should do. That way, <laughs> that way you put it on people's mind. Okay. Um, exactly. So the, the obviously, you know, here we are on the last day of March, and you know, our we got to give out belts. Hold, hold on, we got to give out belts before we go any further, Brian. Before we even get into HBCU, well, we got to give me, Easter. If you let me set it up because I know what you want okay. to do early, but I'm gonna let I you go know. ahead. I, go ahead because you want to. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, man, th this is one of them days you didn't get you didn't got in trouble at school, and you waiting on and daddy coming home, and daddy gonna have to handle his business when he get in the house, Brian. Show the picture, Brian. Just show the picture. Yeah, let people know what they're looking at here. I'm gonna get it once we get the picture up. We the picture's get up. to it. 
Picture's there. All right, the picture is up. Now, what is that? What is that a picture of? First off, that is a picture of the basketball floor in Portland, Oregon, which is the site of the women's NCAA uh, Sweet 16 and Elite Eight for not one, but two regionals, Brian. Two regionals. Two regionals. That's, so, that's different. That's different. Yes, I don't know. This first year I've seen them do that. So uh, they've got two regionals in Albany, two regionals in Portland. So you've played so games of doing, there. Instead of doing like what the men do and what they have traditionally done. Four sites. Four sites. They have two yes, sites. They took two. Correct. Okay. So which means you've played the round of 16 on Friday for one mm-hmm. regional. The round of 16 on Saturday for another regional. Right. That's two games per day. And that Baylor or USC that. game was sat uh was a Saturday, Saturday night. Right. And pregame today, someone noticed. Just no, your your picture is not off if you look at the three point line. Look at the difference of the distance between the top of the key and the three-point arc. Mm -hmm. Left side versus the right side. Yes. If you notice, the one on the right is a little bit further than the one on the left. That is not because of the angle of the picture. The lines are actually off. Mm-hmm. They Very are noticeable. two different distances. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe we said the one on the right is the regulation length, Brian. I believe that is the, uh, what is it, 22 yeah, feet is what it's supposed to be? Feet, one, 22 feet, one and three quarter inches. Yeah, right. Which is which is the international line because they use a metric uh, mm-hmm. number international. That's why you get those funny uh, numbers. Mm-hmm. So... The one on the right is somewhere between there, looks a little bit closer to the old three-point line, which was 20 feet, nine inches. You mean the one on the left? The one on the left. The one on the left. I'm sorry, the one on the left. Right. Edwin, <laughs> I don't know how you not you not know which one is correct. <laughs> you pull out the tape measure and you measure from a that that. And when, from the baseline, or don't you measure from the baseline, right? You measure from the baseline. It's, it's from the, it's, the, the 22 is from the center of the basket. But there is, if okay. you, I, Brian, I have line basketball courts. I have had to put down temporary lines on a basketball court. It is not fun. It is not easy. But you can go to Google. And get the diagram. Oh yeah. And tell you if you if you're measuring from the baseline, it needs to be here. But if you're measuring it from the center of the basket, this is the distance that you're supposed to go. They have all of these measurements on Google. The NCAA has a manual. It's about that thick that has all these different court markings that you are required to have. Mm-hmm. And they have a First manufacturing all, company that does all these courts, Drew. So it's not like it's not like they use several different companies. I don't believe. I think they use probably one. Now they may use two companies, but they probably keep everything within one company. Right. And a lot of times these courts get recycled. This court oh, yeah. comes out it's for the smart, sweet, yeah. for the Sweet Sixteen Final Eight. They they put it in storage and, and they move it to the site for next year, and then they change the graphics on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, let me get back. I don't like the sterilization of the floors. Uh, you don't know, when you look at the game, when you look at the game, you don't know what city they playing in. Yeah, but if you just have, the, that, only, the only way you know is if you look at center court right there. If you at center court where it says Portland, there's you know. I they mean, they I, control I, all the advertising. They take all the. What arena are they playing in? The Portland. 
Exactly. I don't care. I don't care. I'm watching the game. I don't care about where they're playing. Uh, yeah, but you you look at this thing when you look back at these highlights for five years from now. You can't. You used to be able to look and say, "Hey, so before we even knowing what year it was, that was on that court. That was that year." That was in Louisville that year, or that was in Kentucky. That was in uh, who 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 remembers uh, the one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or the ones in the in the old Georgia Dome? You could look out of back, the bro, the the gold court in the Superdome when Michael yeah. Jordan hit the shot. I yeah, I mean, I I can tell you what color the court was. I can tell you what color the court was. But that, Drew, when, that's uh, different. That's di- the final yeah. four courts are oh, different sorry. than these regionals and these opening yeah. round courts. You know that. Yeah. Not too not too much. They're still the sterile courts. Yeah. All right. Anyway, move forward. Go ahead. We'll anyway, we, anyway, moving forward. But anyway, you nobody checked the nobody checked these courts for measurement. And shame on the players because everybody has played at least one game on their court, right? Right. I'm not I'm not necessarily putting it on the coaches because the coaches don't get out there and shoot. But the players, nobody nobody noticed it. And yes, the shooting percentages on the court on the left were slightly higher than the shooting percentages on the court on the right. <laughs> yeah, they should be. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's a the one, half the one a step on the left closer. is the old. The one on the F, the, the left is the old, uh, or maybe a year or two ago. That used to be the women's line. The twenty foot nine, whatever. yeah, twenty foot nine, right. So um, here, here's the inner. Here's let me let me let me jump in and add something. Here's what's a really interesting, right? On that very court, North Carolina State, who was a three seed, played Texas, a one seed, in a regional finals, right? And I guess, like yes. you're saying, they discovered it before that game. Well, both coaches agreed to just go ahead and play forward because they said, well, since you changed sides, yeah, you know, it, it wouldn't, it would, it, how much of an effect would it have? Because everybody's going to get the it's, shoot. It's a, it's a major effect. I, oh, well, I will tell you why. It's a, yeah, I, I know so, but I, I get you. I get you. So, you know, but the question is, who shot on what side first? Now, and I say that exactly. because, because North Carolina State ended up beating Texas by 10. And I believe at the half, North Carolina State was up by 12. North Carolina State was up, let me see, 7 plus 5. Yeah, that, they were up by 12 points at the half. And I believe another interesting stat was the three-point shooting. North Carolina State was 9 of 18 from behind the arc in the game. Texas was 1 of 6. So the question is, what side of the floor did North Carolina State shoot from in the first half? You know, if they shot from the side on the right, then Texas, you made a mistake. Texas coach, you made a mistake by choosing to not have them redo the lines, which they could have temporarily put out some lines. It would have it would have caused a serious delay. But it would have caused it would have been a couple of hour delay. Yeah, I, but but still, I in terms of what's fair and equitable, uh, yeah, I would have I would have called for that, especially. The, the number one seed. Now, you know, you'd like to go in and think that's not going to matter, but who knows? I, I don't, I don't have, I'm trying to pull up the stats and see how much of a difference it did make in, in, in did. It looks like based on the graphic, um, don't you, don't, doesn't the home team usually sit to the left of the, of the facing the score table? You're an official, right? Well, How's just- that well, well, well it, it depends on the court, but if you just look at it, look look at where the players are going to the bench. So the, the bench on the right. The home team is, is to the left. Is, the home team is to the left, and the visitors are to the right because you see the dark jerseys going to the right of yeah. the score. So thing. that would have been Texas. Texas would have been on the left bench in the first half shooting to the right. North Carolina State would have been on the right bench shooting to the left. The shorter side in the first half. Yeah. Guess who was up by? Guess who again? Who was up by twelve in the first half? That would have been a visitor. 
Yes. I, I amazing that that would happen. Amazing. Yes. So uh, big time blunder, big time blunder by the NCAA, and and uh, you know. <laughs> And tomorrow, let's be real. They can't. It, it, that's that's a stained court with, you know, with right. the shade one shade inside the uh, arc, one shade outside the arc. They can't redo that in twenty four hours, Brian. Is that the same court where Iowa and LSU are playing tomorrow? Or are they playing in Albany? They're playing in. They're Albany. playing in Albany. Right. This the USC well, is playing. Uh, here. Um, who is USC, USC is playing. Uh, who are they playing in the in the final? In the, oh, Connecticut, Connecticut, USC and Connecticut. Yes, on that floor. So no, I oh they'll they'll have a white line. They'll have a white. They'll line have two lines. There. There'll, there'll be a double line on one side. Yeah, which hell, I I don't. I of course I would do. I would definitely do that. I would definitely do that. So yeah. All right. So, well, but the NCAA. Anyway, good job, NCAA. Brian. Good job. Brian, I need to go full screen. We got we we got we got to get the NCAA to bill. <laughs> one for every game played on that court. Well, it's about eight lashes. How many games did they put? One, two, three. They that played about five. four games. Uh, that was five. Yeah, five, five, five games, games on that court. Five games. Yeah. Five lashes. Drew, hilarious. Yeah. All right, let's yeah, give them the bill. Let's let's take our first break of the show, and let's uh, let's recap some of the uh, past week. A great month and a great week of uh, HBCU basketball. I, I think it's a great month overall. So we'll talk about it, and some interesting scenarios and some interesting perspectives about how you evaluate this season. What is the value of winning in non NCAA tournaments versus? making the trip to the NCAA that some teams did. And before we go, just because Steve asked for one time for Kofi. <laughs> All right. With that, <laughs> with that uh, let's take a first break of the day. You're watching the BCSN Sports Wrap right here on the Black College Sports Network. We'll be back in just a moment. Supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University Sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU Athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to The Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. Hey Edwin, I didn't want y'all to call the uh, call the child protective services on me, so uh, you know I sterilized it because we were on uh, video. 
<laughs> Welcome back to the BCSN Sports Trap. Uh, that's AD Drew. I'm Brian Fulford. AD, the the uh, the 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 Punisher, the uh, the dis- the disciplinarian of the show, uh, laying out uh, laying out licks for uh, for uh, for foolishness as 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 the NCAA. straight to the NCAA. Yeah, straight to the NCAA. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, okay, so hey, real quick update for everybody watching: North Carolina State up forty to thirty-eight, going into the under twelve timeout. Um, love it, love it, love it, love it. Let's go, Wolfpack. One, one bucket, one bucket. Hey, I'll, I'll take it because it's one one bucket in NC State. You know, Duke Duke doesn't want to be in a close game with these fellas. Duke doesn't want to be in a close game. Uh, okay, they so beat, they beat up in the ACC tournament, so you are right. They did exactly, exactly. You know the the, uh, the quarters. Uh, uh, yeah, it was. It was Duke's. I think it was Duke's first game. First game out. Matter of fact. Um, so yeah, first game in, and NC State had already played two, so they were they were the hot team going in. You know, into that uh, matchup. So uh, we we had a great week. Look, we. Going into postseason basketball, and after the, all the conference tournaments and things like that, we're gonna rewind almost to about half a month ago, like March, like the March fifteenth was sort of that big day where you had the start of the uh, Division Two playoffs, the NAIA playoffs, um, and then the conference semifinals in MIAC, SWAC, and and a few other uh, leagues, but. We had really, uh, I guess now we could say two weeks now, two weeks ago, there were 12 HBCU programs that were playing basketball. Um, You know, we were kind of, we were tracking this on our own, right? And um, well, I'm I'm just looking real quick here back at our notes. from Tuesday, March 19th, uh, uh, we had an amazing run of HBCU games. You know, we had schools that were, you know, on the Division II level that, you know, Fayetteville State making it to the regional finals. Uh, we had the start of the first four. We had Grambling winning their very first NCAA tournament game. Um, you had Alabama A&M getting a win in the CIT. You had Grambling women and North Carolina Antes women getting their first wins in the WNIT. Uh, you had Langston advancing in the national tournament uh, all the way into – uh, last weekend, when we did last weekend's show, Drew, and I mean, just just an outstanding week of, of basketball. Um, but obviously, the big stories in this course of this week, of uh, the past week, it all started really with, uh, let's see if I'm just kind of looking at the calendar here. It really started with the Sunday when, matchup. Bradley. Uh, actually, the day before that was Sunday. Sunday, North Carolina a ts women in the okay. in the court. I guess it would be the thirty-two of the women's NIT against Old Dominion, <clears throat> and they ended up there. They were hosting their second consecutive game in the, the Corbett Center against Old Dominion, and they ended up winning forty-eight to forty-five on a pretty much a a last. I, I would say a three-point shot with about maybe 0.6 remaining. Um, just one of those epic shots. And I, I wish I would have pulled up. I wish I would have captured the uh, the picture that I saw on Aggie's, uh, on Lady Aggie's website. Um, because I, I think it, it just showed, it's one of those moments, one of those still frames where you can see the ball just coming off the young lady's hands. And you can see, if you just look at everybody behind her, because she shot it right in front of her own bench. And you could see, you could just, one of those pictures, Drew, that you could go and look at and see different faces and everybody's reaction from the players to the coaches to the fans. 
Um, it's one of those pitchers that should go up in the, you know, in, in the halls of uh, the North Carolina ENT sports, um, sports complex. It, it, it's that cool of a shot. Um, the defining, I don't know, you can call it the defining moment. I, I obviously they got a big win against their, their crosstown rival the game before, but just everything that went into that run for uh, North Carolina a and uh, So that's how it started. Can, Go ahead. Can I stop you right there? Shout out to the WNIT for having the, you can't say, you can't say the balls with WNIT, but having the, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, the breast, for lack of a better oh, word. Jesus. To give no seriously to give A and T the home game, not only one home game but multiple home games in the tournament, because you know as well as I do that the HBCUs tend not to get these home games in the tournament. I'm so, curious as I, to why. I, I don't know. And I don't know what the I revenue. Dave is in the chat room. Dave, I'd I'd love to know if you know any of the background about why AT hosted those games. I mean, I because again, I, I'm just I'm curious. Oh, okay. So he said AT had to pay to host those games. Okay. Right. right. But with with them paying, do they get the revenue from everything once they hopefully, pay? Because, hopefully. Hopefully. because I mean they had some excellent attendance, uh over, I believe over three thousand for each of those games that they yes. hosted. I read so, that. Yep. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that that's great. You know, shout out to shout out to those Aggie fans for for showing up and showing out and packing Club Corbett. Not once, not twice, but three times. I don't know if the students had to pay or they went with their regular uh, policy where students would get in for free. But. You know, even if the students had to pay for them finding the money for them to pay or if the university paid for the students, which happens a lot of times uh, for stuff like that. The university will write a check for the uh, to cover the X amount of students. So, yeah, um, after that game, the Aggies advanced to the 16, the round of 16, where you mentioned that third game they hosted. They played Troy. They played Troy University. Um uh, a, who they were a little overmatched um, in that game, which was kind of interesting because they gave up 89 points. They scored 75. And the, the two games prior, I mean, those were like slugfest. I mean, those games, I think they may have uh, – well, it's on the sheet. One of those games was a 48-45, and the other game was a low-scoring game as well. But um, the, the attendance – the I think one of the games were you know uh, was televised free, uh, so you got a chance to watch that. I don't know if the third game was was free or not, but um, I'm gonna read a quote here from their coach uh, Terrell. And Robinson. we got to hear, the, and we got to also got to hear the regular A and T uh, people with Donald Ware and everybody else uh, on the call. Right. Uh, Coach Robinson said uh, in 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 regards to the run, uh, he said it creates a buy in. Uh, Robinson said about the Aggies run to the WNIT Super 16 with wins over UNC Greensboro and Old Dominion. Quote, it creates a fan base because it shows Lady Aggie basketball has a good show to put on for those who are returning players. I hope the commitment. Uh, in the summer, the commitment in the preseason and the commitment once we start playing and the commitment during conference pushes us where we need to go. And, you know, hey, look, the Lady Aggies were for the better part of the year, the number two team in the CAA. Um, yeah, I think they end up falling to fourth when the tournament started because of some tiebreakers but you know what an outstanding season it's really the second year in a row that the lady aggies have have had a great conference season and um you know it, it, the, it the caa is a one bid league so the hell the team who was really the most dominant team 
in that league, Stony Brook, I think they ended up losing in the in the conference tournament. So they didn't even go to the NCAA. Uh, so it, it just overall was a good a good position for North Carolina A and T basketball. You know, um, who I've been I've been real high on as a program, even back to the last year when they were in the MEAC. And, you know, then I think after that last year that they won the MEAC, I think is when they transitioned over to the CAA. But they've had, you know, this has been a strong program. Well, what's your what's your thoughts, Drew, as you and and let's juxtapose that because, the well, before I ask this, the other school, Grambling, Grambling, who was also in the WNIT, they got a big win in their first round game on the road. Then they had to go to northern Louisiana and play UL Monroe, and that game was brutal. I mean, UL Monroe, I, I think, beat them, uh, what, 102 to 70-something, but, I mean, it, it was just a, a, a clobbering. But they didn't get the chance to play at home. They went on the road twice. But um, just what's your thoughts on what it means for North Carolina a and and Grambling and juxtapose that to Norfolk State and Jackson State, who, yes, they won their tournament. They had a great conference run, but they ran up against, obviously, you run up against 15 and 16 seeds, or I'm sorry, 15, you run up as a 15 seed going on the road at Stanford. Jackson State, a 14 seed on the road going to UConn. Can you make any comparison? It is I, I hate to say the word. Would you rather be a t or Grant or uh, Grambling versus being Norfolk State and Jackson State? I, I hate to put it like that, but it's in, in, in a in a in a in a less simplistic way. Who would you rather be at the end of the day? Because repeat the last part, my uh, my earpiece came out. I said to to put it short, who would you rather be? Would you would you rather be, you know, A and T and Grambling, or would you rather be Jackson State or um, Norfolk State? And, and I'm and I'm referring to the postseason run, not necessarily the conference per se. <sighs> On the women's side, it's tough because if you were to ask me that on the men's side, Brian, then my next question to you would be, what seat am I sitting in? Mm -hmm. Because on the men's side, obviously, we know where where the money is at. The money is at the NCAA level. But as a coach... I realistically have a chance to do some damage in these lower tournaments. So, uh, you know, it, it it's tough. If I'm going into the NCAAs as a 15 or 16 seed, yes, I'm happy that I won my conference championship. Yes, I'm going to prepare to beat the, the competition, <laughs> but let's be real. Even at a 14 seed, Jackson State had nothing for UConn. No. Nothing. 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 And Norfolk State had nothing. And when you're a coach of a team, you really want to have the feeling that you have a realistic shot. I won't say 50-50, but you have a realistic shot of beating the opponent. Not, it's going to take a miracle. Uh, We've all coached games, Ryan, where we knew it was going to take a miracle to beat our opponent. And every now and then, even a broke clock is right twice a day, Ryan. And you you will get a dub every now and then. But uh, from a program building perspective it may be better that i was in a w 
what is it, WBIT or WNIT? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as far as building my program. But that's also assuming here's the new here's the new factor, Brian, that I can keep those kids in my program. Because you want the practices, you want the camaraderie. And if I've got a bunch of seniors, what a, what a way to take them out with this postseason run. You don't care what level it's on. You always want to take your seniors out with a good postseason run, man. So uh, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's, it's just going to depend on my, my situation. But last thing, knowing in those other two tournaments – that I have an opportunity to play in front of my home crowd in the postseason kind of leans me to those tournaments. And that's no disrespect to what Jackson State did or what Norfolk did because the experience of playing in the NCAA tournament is prob- is arguably second to none. Um, some great comments here. Um I'm going to go back for a second and pull up uh, a couple of them here um, because I, I Dave brings up a great point that, yeah, it, this is very similar to that football debate that we always get into about the merits of going to the Celebration Bowl versus the FCS playoffs. And and I guess. What do I have a realistic shot of winning? No, no I, I have a ball. No, no, no. I don't think that's the debate. I don't think that's the debate. I think no. the debate. I think the debate is which is the financially better spot to be in because I think we've moved past where can we compete. It's it's it's, it's two separate it's two separate debates though, Brian. And, but, but, and but how, one how you debate depends on how you debate it depends on what seat you sit in. If you're sitting in an administration seat, you're always going to take the position of what's going to uh, financially benefit my program. And there's no, and there's no question. If you bring it into the celebration bowl, that the celebration bowl is going to financially benefit any HBCU. Right. I, you know, yeah, I, I, get, I, I, get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Right. Right. Um, when, when you, when you are some of those other people, coaches, a coach you go to the celebration bowl, you know you have as close to a 50-50 chance of winning that celebration bowl. Because you got your equal, conference equal champion. level. In your conference First of all, your conference champion. champion your conference champion. Uh, most HBCUs have similar similar budgets. So you you you're competing. You it's like like competition. Brian, it's like being a 4A school in, in your state. Yeah. There are certain seven A schools that you can play with, but when you go up against that powerhouse seven A school in your state, come on now, let, let's be real. It's going it's going to be garbage time by halftime, and that's what you get into when you get into some of these situations, man. Um, I I think uh, uh, looking at some of the comments, you know, right here, you know, from definitely guys like uh, Lawrence. Uh, a great point about not having a chance to be a black college national champion. I mean, I, oh, you know. I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dispute that. And, and well, let's say, uh, here we go. If Jackson state does not have the type of year that they have had, the being undefeated, had, being undefeated in the swag is what you're referring yes. to. Yeah. If Jackson state was not the unicorn, yeah, mm-hmm. AT did have a realistic uh, a realistic shot. And on the and on the men's side. It's gonna be interesting. That's an interesting one. Yeah. It, it will yeah. be because it, cause, cause you have that debate on the men's side, definitely. Oh, for sure. Especially between and I'm a, I'm assuming you're referring to between Grambling State and Norfolk, Norfolk State. Gr- yeah. Grambling State, Norfolk State, and where you how would one to be at? So yeah, it's a three way, it's a three way debate. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I'm just saying you point. have. To, you no, have you're to, right. Nobody's to, talking Howard about Howard, though. It. Nobody's talking about Howard, though. right? But you have to include Howard in the conversation because not only did Howard win the MEAC, but they took two out of three from Norfolk this season. Yeah, good point. Good point. 
So it's going to be interesting on the men's side who's going to be that national champion. The reason a the reason a and t he uh who was that who said he didn't think a and t had a shot at being national champion? I lost the comment already. Uh, Lawrence, that, Brian? Lawrence, Lawrence, right. Lawrence, right? And I think maybe the reason Lawrence may feel like a and t didn't have a chance is because a and t is not in the HBCU conference anymore, and he, mm-hmm. Lawrence may feel like a and t is forgotten because they're not in the HBCU conference anymore. Right. But to us in at least, at least at this media organization, yeah, we talk trash on A and T. Don't don't get us wrong. We 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 I, don't we I gonna don't, talk tra- I don't talk we, trash we, about them. You mean we, 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 we on some talk. We have we have fun with A and T. We we definitely have fun with it, with A and T. But trust me, we follow a and t and we definitely do everything that a and t did this season on the women's side and we were pulling for a and t to win the c the caa i would yeah, think yeah. i would cut my comments off right there brian because uh, yeah let me, like let, me, get, let me let me let me get one yeah. let me get one in there i gotta i gotta respond to edwin here in this whole debate edwin brings up uh would i rather have a date with the girl you didn't get in high school or a date with angela bassett uh, you know, <laughs> how much is the dead girl in high school making right now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, and Edwin, how many kids I, do she have? <laughs> look, I don't know Angela Bassett. I don't know Angela Bassett. I know I see what I see and what you see on TV, but I know some of the girls, some of the some of the women that that I missed out on, and I'm always sad about it. That's all I'm gonna say. And so, you know, for me, I'm 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 a nostalgic kind of person. And that's what I hate about Facebook. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. I hate Facebook. <laughs> go to break before you get us in, before I do, you get in trouble. Before I get in trouble, I you know I need to go get married. That's my yeah. I need to get married ASAP. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're gonna talk with the uh, the head coach of the Langston University Lions, Coach Chris Wright. On the other side, we're gonna talk to him. An amazing season that Langston had on their run to the NAIA National Championship. So we're going to talk to him about the the season, the game, and and just moving forward. All right? It's coming up on the other side. If you got any questions, drop them in the chats, and uh, we we got some time. We'll ask Coach Wright about it. So uh, hang in there. You're watching the BCSN Sports Wrap right here on the Black College Sports Network. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dashboard, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www dot slowburnwaco.com All right, 
right, welcome back to the BCSN Sports Wrap. Brian and AD, before we bring on our next guest, just a reminder, do me a favor, folks. Hit the thumbs up button uh, if you're watching us on YouTube. Hit the like button if you're watching us on Facebook. We appreciate everybody in the chat room. We, we love you, appreciate you. Just a reminder, all of our shows are available in podcast form on the BCSN Pod Zone everywhere. You listen to podcasts, you can hear not only our show, but all of the shows on the Black College Sports Network throughout the course of the week. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and bring and in. And don't forget to vote for Morgan. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Did you, you put a short link out there? Yeah, I put a, I'll put a short link out there again. Okay. All right. Good deal. Did you? Okay. There it is. Okay. So, yeah. If I in in. Appreciate you going in, and uh, one of Drew's former teammate uh, players is uh, is available in that uh, Blue Jacket. No talking about that. Quiet. We're not we're not talking about that right now. Blue Jacket, be quiet. All right, let's bring on our next guest. He is the head coach of the Langston Lions, uh, thirty five and two uh, trip to the NAIA national championship game. Coach Chris Wright. We always love having you on the show. Coach, how you doing, Coach? Fellas, I'm alive. I'm alive. I guess that's good, right? Amen. 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 It is that, that, that's it, Coach. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> good to see you. Hope you and your family had a, had a great Easter um, uh, today or this morning. Um, how's the last few days been for you, Coach? I, I know, Drew and I were just talking about it. If you've been in coaching for any period of time, We've been there on both sides of it. Um, what What's the last few days been like for you? Man, it's been tough, um, obviously, right, to get a chance to go back to the national championship game and um, to be up 13 halfway through the second half and then to be up six with less than a minute to go. And, you know, it's crazy since I've been a head coach again in the last seven years. We haven't blew either one of those leads. So, um, hey, tough, tough Sunday. Obviously, I uh, mean, God's amazing. It's great to uh, be able to celebrate Easter. But, yeah, it's going to take a little bit to get over this one. What um, what what were some of the messaging or what's – I mean, I know it's – I've been there, especially, you know, that last game, a championship game. i uh, been there, unfortunately, the last two years with, with my high school program. Um, what What kind of things do you go through and say – to your players, many guys who have played for you for possibly the last time, or it might be their last uh, collegiate game. You know, I don't, I don't think there's probably any words that kind of do it justice. Right. Um, man, I'm extremely proud of our guys. Um, you know, we, we, we understand man to be an HBCU and uh, win a national championship. Um, you know, you got to be significantly better than everyone else. And uh, man, I'm proud of our guys. I'm proud of what they were able to do this year for sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Drew. All right. Um, coach, you know, uh, I, I wanted to hit you that night, but I, I knew better as a, as a former coach that that was not the night to, uh, to hit you up uh, on Tuesday night because uh, of all this, let's be real of all the cussing and fussing that you, that we do when we coach it, especially in the, in the heat of the moment. And uh, so I hit you up the next day and, you know, we, we had conversation. We, I'll keep that uh, to myself, but uh, just talk about in, in the moment of, of the game, what's, what's going through your mind do, during that, during that run uh, that they put on you? Cause there were a couple of times you couldn't get the ball in bounds. Looks like the, the consistency of the officiating had been consistent until like the last two, three minutes of the ball game when you guys were, were up and pretty much the, can I say it? The fat lady had, to, had the tea ready. She was gargling the tea, but she, <laughs> but she never got the same. So, uh, you know, what, what's, what's going through your mind in the heat of the moment as you're trying to make these adjustments and trying to get over because, one bucket during that time, and you break the momentum, and you're you're holding up the trophy. So talk to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, one bucket or one stop. Um, you know, and that's 
Ah, you know, that's that's the beauty of uh, of basketball this time of the year, but it's also kind of the the brutality of it, right? Um, you know, I told a lot of people I was watching uh, you know, special with Coach K and Roy Williams before we left for Kansas City. And, you know, they asked Coach K what was the difference between um, you know, his great teams and his championship teams. And he said, one play. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I think that was that was true that night. You know, I mean, we're up 13 to, with, you know, um, you know, halfway through the second half, could have closed it out. We didn't. Uh, you know, I thought in the first half we were up nine at halftime, and I didn't think we played very well. Kind of gave up some easy buckets that we haven't gave up all year. And so, you know, we put ourselves in a bad situation. I mean, I think any time you put yourself in the spot where other factors um, can come into play, like, it's not good for you. And so, uh, man, you know, again, I'm proud of our guys. Wish we could have finished it off, though. Mm-hmm. And if I have the number correct, I want to say you're 67 and five over the two years that you've been there at Langston. I may have the uh, the wins. Sounds uh, about right. Short, 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 short one or two, but I know the five is correct. Um, so two special seasons there at, at Langston. What makes, especially as your group that you had last year and the turnaround that you had last year, what makes this group that you had this year special? You know, it's nice. We had, you know, I guess what four guys that were in our rotation last year back. Um, and so it's always great when you get some returners back. But I think just, man, these guys love each other. They play for each other. They, uh, man, extremely unselfish you know, very committed to everything that we ask them to do. And so, um, you know, it's, and obviously we were extremely talented, but more than that, we just kind of had that, that combination of being really talented and, and, and having great chemistry. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Brian. Um, coach, uh, in, in watching the two games, uh, that the, the well, I mean, obviously the, the two, the two final four games, um, you know, the semi national semifinal in the championship game, there was a great crowd from Langston or the Langston crowd was outstanding. I mean, I, it's hard to, comp- I don't know how it compared to the opponents, but it sounded like <laughs> Langston fans. I think I heard you use comment in one of the uh, in-game interviews that uh, all of uh, everyone from Langston had driven four hours over uh, to Kansas city for, for that game, take a minute if you would and talk about just the support and the crowd that was there. I mean, I know the band was there. Um, it was a lot of pride on display in the championship game. Yeah. Brian, I, before I, you get I, that, oh, oh, coach, I will say this, Brian, because I'm from that area. There is a, a nice Langston following in Kansas City. There's a, a number of Langston alums in Kansas City. And also in St. Louis, where I'm originally from. So I do know uh, that I'm assuming some of those people may have driven over to uh, Kansas City from St. Louis. And, of course, the local people from Kansas City uh, joined. I didn't mean to cut you off, Coach. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, hey, that's very true. We have a great alumni chapter in Kansas City. Um, You know, it's part of what makes Langston special, right? Um, You know, uh, I guess three seasons ago we played in the national championship at Talladega and Honestly, we had nobody there, right? We had our athletic director and former president, and to be honest, felt like no one really cared. And then you 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 come to Langston, and right, your whole administration is there. You have um, you know so many alumni, former players, um, just just friends of the program, and it was night and day difference. And so that was really special to be able to right play play for a national championship in front of that environment and that much support. Yeah. Um... I found it interesting, the NAIA, that you had four number one seeds making it to that point. Um, And I'll put up the basketball that I saw in the three games among the four one seed is just as good as anything that I have seen uh, on CBS, TNT, True, any of those other networks. Speak to the. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I, I go put. I, you yes, know what I'm <laughs> yeah, every, everyone knows what I'm talking about. But, coach, talk a little bit about the NAIA basketball and the level of basketball 
Um, because I think sometimes it, it look for people who are not familiar, I've had to do so much educating of high school kids who they're like, Coach, what, are you, what game are you watching? Oh, and I'm telling them about Langston. I'm telling them about <laughs> NAIA. They're like, what's the NAIA? I'm like, well, look, let me tell you about this, this, this program in Oklahoma. Or let me tell you about the NAIA. And it's an educational thing for a lot of kids. And they're like, oh, okay. So yeah. I, what's, what's that like? Or just talk about what the level of play and the competition and, and, uh, and, and how special and good it is at the NAIA level. You know, so I think what, regardless of what level you're at, right, there's there's a lot of different levels to it, right? Obviously, as you look in Division One, there's the Power Five, there's really good ma- mid-majors, and then there's, right, like there, there's kind of everyone else. Um, I think the NAI is kind of the same. I mean, if you look at the top 10 or 12 in the NAI, it's, it's really, really good basketball. And, uh, you know, like as we're recruiting, we always tell guys like, hey, if we're right, if we're trying to win a national championship, we got to go out and be able to beat about 30% of uh, division ones on any given night. And so, uh, man, it is, it's really good basketball. The final four was special. Um, as you guys alluded to, um, you know, I mean, I know our final four game was against college of Idaho, which they, they, they might've been the best team in the whole tournament. You know, the defending national champions with everyone back except one player. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it is, it's, it's, it's really, really good basketball. And, you know, I think that's kind of a, a misconception out there. People hear NAI and think they're going to walk into a gym with a bunch of bums. And it's like, no, that's, you know, that's, that, that's not the case. Um, you know, so I, I thought it was, you know, great coaches and really, really good players uh, the last few days in Kansas City. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We'll agree 100% on that. Go ahead, Drew. Speaking of uh, the College of Idaho, I want to take you back to that semifinal game, Coach. And College of Idaho plays a three-two matchup. They switch to a uh, to a one-three-one matchup uh, at certain point in times in the game. But I'm gonna be honest, and I and Brian and I were. I don't know if he was on the phone or if we was chatting. But we, we were debating. We were watching. This, we were breaking the game down, man. We were watching the game. If we had done a live, yeah, we were watching we done a live game. show, boy. It would have been great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and for those who don't know, Brian and I do this all the time. We'll, uh, we, we'll <laughs> pick a game and we'll, we'll be going back and forth with each other. But that matchup zone was something that Jim Beheim would have been proud of from Syracuse and it looked like it gave you all fits for a long time until you were able to, uh, to you were able to figure it out uh, by bringing the post up and making them defend the post and then uh, playing off of the post. But anyway, uh, just talk about that, that, that defense and how tough it is in one day to prepare for such a, for lack of a better word, gimmicky defense as a uh, three-two matchup zone, because most teams don't even play a standard zone anymore. But not only to go up against a, a zone, but then a matchup zone in 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 less than a day to prepare for it. Well, so Kobe Blaine again, obviously defending national champions. Um, shoot, he's he's a lot better coach than I am. I mean, that was that was about as frustrated offensively as I've, I've I think I've ever been in my career. Um, you know, we knew we were going to have to make shots against it. Um, you know, they do such a good job of, like you said, not only matching with things, but just making adjustments. However you attack it throughout the game, they're going to adjust to it and give you a different look. And so, um, you know, typically this year we've absolutely shredded zones, you know, and, and um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we had no answers for it the first 32 minutes of the game. You know, I thought we got some good looks early that just didn't go in, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to play against, especially on, uh, you know, a one day turnaround and, they're so good in it. It's kind of like our pressure, right? It's really, really hard to simulate by opposing teams. And so, um, yeah, we were really fortunate to win that game. I thought it was kind of a 50-50 game. And, you know, luckily we were able to make enough plays to get it done that night. Yeah, that that was a game that also came down the stretch. But uh, on that defense. day, you guys were able to defense hold on. Game, <laughs> right. Yes. The de- Drew, the defense in that game, because that was the game where you, had he- you, got- you guys held them to their lowest output I believe of the season, if I recall, I like the commentator 20, was singing like twenty some odd points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I kept trying to tell people in the chat. I'm like, oh, but holding teams to under 
60 is what Langston does. They, you know, <laughs> it's funny educating me. Here I am. I look, I'm a Chris Wright fan, so I'm educating people <laughs> in the chat room about about Langston basketball. And I'm like, oh, Langston holds people under 60. This is normal for them, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they but they used to score way well above sixty though. <laughs> For sure, I, you know I, I feel like, and obviously, you know, we kind of hang our hat on who we are defensively. I mean, I think going into the tournament, we were giving up about fifty-seven points a game, um, but you know, we, we scored over eighty, and so like sometimes I, I think kind of our defense overshadows what we do offensively, right? Like we have really good players. We don't turn the basketball over. We're very efficient. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and I just think it, you know, at the end of the day, come tournament time, if you can really, really defend, um, it doesn't matter who you play or where you play at, you're going to give yourself a chance to, you know, to to cut down the nets. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And I want to talk. I want to talk uh, about a couple of your players uh, here, Coach. Uh, to be Anthony Roy is the heartbeat of your team, and you as when he plays good, your team plays good. When he when he doesn't play good, you guys still play good, but you play much better when he's playing when he's playing good. Uh, Cortez Mosley and uh, Toru Dean, you know those three guys uh, seem to have been the uh, lifeblood of your team uh, this season. Uh, just kind of talk about those guys, whether those guys have any eligibility remaining, and anybody else who I left off that list. Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned Anthony Roy; he was a Player of the Year in our league. I um, mean, he's a big, big, big time scorer. And I was proud of him throughout the year, how he kind of um, – man, he grew up a lot. I think really started to understand that he can do things besides scoring to really impact, right, the game. And so, uh, you know, Ansa a junior, um, you know, kind of our deal with him. Uh, you know, he came from New Mexico State where he was like 11, 12 a game. And, mm -hmm. you know, we told him if he came here and took care of business and did what he needed to do, we would help him go back to Division One. So – I'm sure, um, you know, we'll see him playing on TV somewhere next year. Um, obviously, we're going to keep our word with what we told him. Um, but, yeah, this is, you know, taking 20 points a game out of your lineup is uh, is a big loss, right? And then you look at guys like Teru Dean and Cortez Mosley that came with us to Langston our first year. Just both guys that were, you know, extremely tough um, and unselfish. Uh, you know, Teru was a, uh, I think, third-team All-American this year. Um, you know, Cortez probably should have been one. Um, you know, he was the defensive player of the year, back to back years for us in the Sooner Athletic Conference. And so yeah, that's that's that's, that's three guys that we're gonna have to replace and and figure out how to move forward without. But I love all three of those guys. I'm really proud of them. Um, you know, I think again, they've done everything that we've asked and and more. And so I, I look forward to seeing, you know, the big things that God has for all three of those guys in their future. Coach, uh, I've got one from uh, someone in our chat room. This comes from uh, Edwin Moore, and he says, "Does Coach find kids that 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 fit kids that fit that discipline, or is it basically coaching to them once they join the team?" You know, I think a little of both, right? I mean, one, we want to get talented guys, but man, I, I think we do want guys that have gotten over themselves that want to grow, um, but. So, you know, I mean, obviously it's, man, at the NAI level, we're going to get guys that, um, man, they, they got to grow in some area if they're good enough to help us win the national championship. And so I think just, just getting dudes that, that understand that, that want to get better, that, um, you know, that, that, that are hungry to learn, I think is, is important. But yeah, you know, when you get here, we, you, you, there, there's no choices on how unselfish you're going to be or how hard you're going to play. Um, right. That stuff kind of gets, gets beat into them. And so, uh, so yeah, I think it's a mixture of a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Um, coach, I want to, I want to talk about the, just, just give me a second to kind of speak on how the process begins now, obviously, you know, uh, with recruiting and the transfer portal being open, um, you know, building the next, national championship caliber program starts started started Wednesday you know it's that you know that's just the nature of the business uh what 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 is the time frame for you how do you and your staff kind of manage the future and uh what what you know what's what's the recruiting schedule like for you 
Yeah, so obviously, you know, we've, we've been talking about that a lot throughout the course of the season, just knowing that we lose a lot of guys. And so, you know, we were able to bring in, um, you know, a guy that played for us at, at Talladega, Cam Bryce, that started about half the game for us when we lost in the national title game. So he was here sitting out in the uh, in the spring. You know, we've been able to sign two other kind of Division One transfers, um, guys that have produced at a higher level. And so, yeah, I mean, we still need about seven or eight guys. And, oh, wow. you know, we, we hope to kind of, you know, get some of those guys early. But also at the NAI level, we realize that, you know, we're going to have to sit back and be patient a little bit, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of the guys that can really help us right now, they, right, they, they, they don't understand that they're not going to be at the, at the power five level or at the mid-major level. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, you know, we're excited about it. You know, I think with the success that we've had, we're, we feel confident that, um, you know, we're going to be able to get back to Kansas City and make another run. But, yeah, it is a lot of guys to replace. And, you know, just, you know, again, being so close to a national title and kind of letting it slip away, it, it does feel like a daunting task. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And yeah. in terms of scheduling, uh, do you look to try to do anything in terms of scheduling um, – different NAIA opponents from different regions. I don't know if that's advantageous for you to do so, because uh, I know sometimes what you do in your region helps. Do you do you maybe look at scheduling Division II programs uh, in the NCAA Division II level? Talk a little bit about the scheduling of the future, if you would. Brian, if you could get us to any division of ones or twos to schedule us, man, we'd appreciate <laughs> it. But I, I, I don't think anybody really wants to do that. Just being real honest with you, um, you know, we've had a couple of division ones on the hook that have canceled on us once they've seen our recruiting classes, and so, man, so yeah, obviously we want to play as good of a schedule as we can. You know, in the non-conference this year, uh, we played LSU Shreveport. That, you know, it, it was the last game before Christmas, and it was right number two versus number four in the country. Um, and so we want to play big time NAI games. Unfortunately, when you've had a lot of success, there's not too many people out there that, you know, that, 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 that will meet you at a neutral site um, um, or, or play anywhere. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think as many good opponents as we can get, though, I think is, you know, is, is great for us. All right. Well, All right. we'll we'll keep we'll keep working on we'll keep working on the back ends, coach. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I I'm all for trying to bring I'm all for trying to bring the best programs together. You know, whether no matter if it's men or women's, I mean, we gotta we gotta bring our teams together. You know, I would love to have a have a day where we have Langston and and a, you know I ain't gonna put any other schools out there, but but you know who you are. Some of you NCAA D two D one programs. Stop ducking Langston. I'm going to just say it. I said it. <laughs> hey, yeah. you know what? Hey, 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 uh, hey, honestly, I can't, I, I can't blame some guys. You know, if I was if I was a low major, I, you, you have nothing to gain by playing a really, really I good in AI, right? Like you're supposed to win the game, and if you don't, right, it's, just, yeah. it's really bad for you and your career. So oh, I, yeah. So I, I, I definitely get it for sure. <laughs> right. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, Coach, we were having this uh, debate on the show early and I just want to get your opinion uh as a coach. It, it, is it how can, how can I say this? You 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 play national tournaments. But you know, there are also other tournaments out there, you know, especially if we could ever get a HBCU basketball tournament. As a coach, which would you rather be in going after that national championship every year? But let's be real. I mean, you've been you've been on a run for the last three, four years. But it, for all us normal coaches, you only get a team like that about once every th every four or five years where you have a team that can make a legitimate title run. Uh, so on, in a normal season, would you rather be in that tournament? No, you're pretty much a sacrificial lamb and going to be going home in the first, second round of a national tournament or be in a smaller tournament, even an HBCU tournament, where you go in with a legitimate chance of bringing home some type of hardware? You know, obviously, I think, you know, um, just with a lot of the challenge that HBCUs face and kind of the uphill battles, right, that we have, I think it's all, it's always cool. Anytime you can be in a tournament with uh, with other HBCUs, but you know, for us, our goal is simple, man. We want to win a national championship or have a chance to win one uh, every single year. And if if we're not in the mix, then 
You know, I mean, with the support that we have here, I don't feel like, um, you know, I'm doing my job right. And we have, we've been very blessed, you know, our last season at Talladega and our two years at Langston, I think we're, um, you know, 98 and 11 with, with two national championship appearances. And so that's right. That's always the goal. And I think if we ever got to a point where I felt like we were a sac- sacrificial lamb, I would, uh, I'd get out of coaching, right? Like that would be, that would be no fun for me. And so I, I, I need to go find something else to do because I'm probably going to end up divorced and my family's not going to like me very much. And, uh, I'm just not a good loser. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, I think again, it's, it's, you know, but again, if we could get in an HBCU tournament in the middle of the year and go play other really good HBCUs, I think that's something that's, that's very intriguing that, that does bring a lot of value. And here's a follow-up from uh, Dr. Cavillo. Uh, Dr. Cavillo is inside the HB sports lab. Uh, what is your thoughts on a non-conference in a IA tournament? So I get, that's kind of a follow-up to the question that I asked. Yeah, so so two years ago we went to an HBCU tournament in uh, in Austin, Texas. Really well done, um, you know, all HBCU teams. That was, that was really nice. Um, it was a you know great tournament put on. Um, and so this year we're going to the Abe Lemons Classic in Oklahoma City. So it's uh, it's an all NAI tournament. Um, some of the best best teams from around the country. And so again, I think anytime you can go on a neutral court and play good competition, um, I think it's something that that, that benefits your program a lot. Yeah. Now there, there's a there's a, a question in the chat room that's been out there, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to ask you to answer it. But uh, you know, a lot of people want to. Let's be real, coach. You know, you've got to know you're one of the hottest names out there for all these HBCU vacancies, not just HBCU vacancies, just coaching vacancies in general. So people are wondering. We're not going to ask you to comment on it or do, uh, do anything else like that because that would be disrespectful and unfair to the to your current institution. But, yes, folks, I put it out there, but we're not going to make them answer it, okay? Just want to let y'all know that. He, he, <laughs> we know he knows. Everybody knows. Yes, would I love to see him in, in, in a different color? Possibly, but he looks good in orange and blue right now. We're going to keep that man in orange. <laughs> You know, AB, it's it's man, and, and hey, I do want to say this. Um, you know, I love Langston, I love our administration, I love our university, I love right, like what we're about here, and it's you know, it's been home to my wife and I, and so you know, we we definitely plan on being here, and also you know, having said that, you never know what ha- God has in store for us, right? Like He, thank goodness, He knows a lot better than than, than I do, right? And uh, you know, I will say this: I think wherever we were at, any division, any level. Um, you know, we would find a way to win basketball games and love our guys and help our guys graduate, um, you know, w- wherever that was. But again, I'm, we've been extremely thankful for our time here. And, you know, we, we look forward for having the chance to, to run this back and, and hopefully bring home the hardware back to Oklahoma next year. Well said. Well said, Coach. Um, hey, uh, Coach, I always appreciate talking with you. Um, one of my favorite people to talk to in March and every other time, every other month of the year, you know, whenever we get a chance, I know it seems like we only use it in February or March, but uh, coach, you are, you are a pleasure. Uh, Langston university. You guys have a great one here in coach, right? And uh, I love the fact that they, they uh, gave you an extension and all that stuff. So they've made the commitment and uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. You, they got a good, they got a good one. So, uh, you know, other folks going to have to do a whole lot to get uh to get coach right but coach Wright's in a good spot so coach um thank you congratulations on a great season like i said we all know we we some you, you coach long enough you're gonna be on both sides of that and so we we felt the pain trust me i i was hurting for you and praying for you yeah. for a couple of days after man definitely but uh but we're, we're proud of the run um and really enjoyed watching uh langston all season really and tracking you guys so uh any last words you want to you want to shout out or say uh coach here i want to give you the last word yeah hey fellas one i, I really appreciate you guys all the great um publicity you bring to uh, hbcus across the country um you know and again i'm you know for us we realized you know going into the national tournament you know we were playing for something uh far bigger than ourselves and so, you know, obviously we were disappointed that we couldn't be the, the first HBCU since 1977 to win a national title. But, 
Um, you know, we believe we're going to have more chances at that. And it's something that, right, that I know I put a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of stock in and a lot of pride in as well as our team does, being able to represent, right, the, the 100-plus HBCUs across the country. So, hey, I appreciate you guys having me on tonight. Happy Easter. Yes, sir. Thank you, Coach. Uh, happy Easter to you and your family. And uh, L's up. Appreciate you. And, uh, appreciate you returning my text and uh, and everything, Coach. How, how they do it? L, you? You that's know. it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coach. Be well. Take care, coach. Hey, appreciate you, fellas. Have a good one. All right, All right coach. coach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Coach Chris Wright. Let's take a break. Come back. I know we got some uh interesting comments and thoughts, so we'll get to those on the other side after the break. Uh, you're watching the BCSN Sports Trap right here on the Black College Sports Network. We'll be back right after this short, very short commercial break. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Amber May, and I'm a voice actor out here in Los Angeles. I'm the voice of Dia in Genshin Impact, Yen Ching in Honkai Star Rail, um, the narrator in Comey Can't Communicate, and I also voice Brooklyn Barbie in the movie Barbie Big City Big Dreams. I'm here to let you know that I'm going to be a guest this year at Urban Nerd Con in Atlanta. Yeah, woo! That's going to be April 26th through the 28th at the... Uh, where, where are we going again? It's going to be at the Cortland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia. So, if you're a Genshin Impact fan, a MiHoYo fan, and you live on the East Coast, you got no excuse. Come see me. Urban Nerd Con. Our heroes, our villains, our stories. Come on down. Let's do it! Let's get it on! Ugh! TheUrbanNerdCon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. Go Wolfpack, go! Oh. I guess I was wrong on that one. <laughs> go Wolfpack, go! <laughs> Hell yeah! Boy, I called that one. Oh, go Wolfpack! I called that, boy. I called it. Wolfpack going to the Final Four. The magical run, man, continues. What's that? Yes, Five, sir. four, nine in a row. Do you know, Drew, they had lost four in a row going into the ACC tournament. Lost four games in a row probably five of the last six, if I recall. And now look at them. Look at them. Nine in a row. Go wait, Wolf Pack. What, mm. Wait, what about, you know, we talk about basketball schools uh, last couple of weeks. Hey, What about yes. UConn and NC State? And NC State. Men and women program. And in women the in the Final Four. Four. That's and, and awesome. I'm going to throw another one out. I'm going to throw another one out there. Who? You know, I wasn't expecting uh, – a spring football game or uh, earlier this uh weekend when uh Alabama played Clemson in a basketball game that meant something this late the season. You know, yeah. I thought I was watching football again. <laughs> yeah. Um I look the shot chart I showed you I think it was uh Gottlieb had tweeted out the uh shot chart from the Alabama game against Clemson. Um and they had all outside the arc and then like several baskets around inside of the circle, inside the half circle, like all like rim touches. No, look, it was either, it was either arc yep. or paint. There no was no mid range. range. No mid, not no. short corner, elbow. Uh, I think there may have been like two mid range shots. I didn't see them. I didn't see them. But that, yeah. that thing, that thing was so, it was crazy looking at the shot chart for Alabama. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So the final four is set and for the men. It'll be uh, Alabama versus UConn, who's been beating everybody by like 15 plus. Uh, and then you've got um, North Carolina State versus Purdue, yeah. which obviously, look, come on. We got to have Purdue versus UConn. We got to have Big 7-5 Edie versus the 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 what's the guy the the 
the Klingon, Klingon is his name, whatever, the, the Yukon Klingon. I don't even know the kid's name, but I'm just calling him the Yukon Klingon. Let's go. Let's get it on. Yukon versus Purdue for the national championship. Let's go. So let's let's look at this. The Big East was much trash. They was talking about the number of teams they didn't get in to the tournament. Right. They still get a Final Four team. One of three. The SEC, of three. The SEC had all them teams in. Eight. The fi- they got in. All of lost. All of lost except for three in the first day. Yep. Three of them were alive this weekend. Two of them <laughs> played each other. That's crazy, right? All of uh, the three who made it past the first past round all made it the Elite Eight. Yeah. Yes. And two of them played each other. So you knew you was gonna lose one, but the other yep. two are, but the other two are still there. And then you've got you've got the big ten. Purdue. The big 10. What it's been like like they the, dominated the big ten. 30, the rest of the 30 big years 10. since Purdue has been there. 1980. 1944 years, 1980. Years. And I remember oh that God. that final four was in my hometown of Indianapolis, Indiana. I remember that. 1980. Yeah. So and then uh, NC State, NC State, in the NC State, an 11 seed, beating out, beat the. Let me see who they beat on the road. They beat the the two seed. Uh, they beat the one seed. I mean, they, they beat they beat everybody who they had to beat. Um, amazing run that they've been on. Now, man. now I'm going off the top of my head. Yeah, but the last two times NC State has made it this far, Go ahead. they won. They won. Uh, 1974 with David Thompson, and then 1980, 1983 with Jim Valvano. Yeah, you might be right. You might be right. I, and I'm just going off the top of my head. I haven't yeah. looked this up. I was, yeah, I was thinking because I, I remember, you know, who I was. I was thinking Houston, but no, Houston lost twice in the championship game. Yeah, yeah Houston right. lost one of those two times to the NC State. State. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh-huh. gonna say Dave, David Thompson because they broke up the UCLA run. They did. Yep, they did. Yep. Yes. And that was and, a game that and look, they, both of those instances, NC State wasn't supposed to win because, matter of fact, uh, the infamous Final Four game between Marquette and NC State, where um, Al McGuire got ejected in the late into the second half of that game. While his team was leading, uh, ended up because of the the technicals and the eventual ejection, the points and the momentum swung to NC State side, who ended up winning that game, and then they went on to uh, to the championship game against UCLA. But right. McGuire's team was widely considered to be a better team back in seventy. What did you say, seventy four or seventy two? I think it was seventy four. I think it was 74. You're right. It was easy. Yeah, 73 or 74. And then, of course, NC State won on the – The Whitberg shot. The, the, the yeah. Whitberg miss at the dunk by uh, Lorenzo The airball and the dunk. Yeah, the follow-through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah. you. So, obviously, you know, getting back to Coach Wright, um, you know, obviously, you know, the um, – you know, it's out there. Look, we, you know, I, you know me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a rattler. We, we have an open head coaching job at FAMU, and we've talked about it on Wednesday's show. Uh, Langston did sign Coach Wright to a contract extension through 2027, I believe. I don't know what type of buyout if there's a buyout in his contract at Langston. Um, you know, I, I know if his name is not on the short list. By what by by it, whether it be the AD or the search committee, then it's criminal. It's criminal that his name would not be in consideration. Now, what you know, whether he goes through the interview process or what you know, all the extra that's stuff totally, but, that's up to him on that portion. That's up to but him, his name, but but his but name, Florida be in him, the consent, Florida consent. in him, yeah, yeah. And and one other school that uh is up for con- that should be talked about, Alabama AM. Because um, according to um, our good friend Mo uh, Carter, um, their coach uh, really is there. There's a uh, he had a two year with an extension contract initially, and so it, it's not confirmed whether 
he'll be the back for the extension has been picked up. Oh, it has. Okay, so that no, 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 happened. it's not confirmed. It's not confirmed, but the extension has been picked up. Oh, you're saying it has not been confirmed. Okay, so so Alabama A and M may be in play. You know, although you know it's tough to say. Alabama A and M has been competitive in the SWAC the last two seasons under uh, their coach. So, you know, the question is, do you feel like I, I think Alabama A and M and Florida A and M are two programs in two different areas? You got one program which has been absolutely horrible the last two years in the SWAC. And another program which has been to the SWAC tournament the last two years. Um, and th let's go ahead and talk, talk about the elephant in the room, also. Uh, you know, everybody has probably seen the article about uh, Tobika Reed, uh -huh. but, you know, we've got from our sources that it's a non story. We've seen the story, but from our sources, we say it's a non story. We think it is a non story. I I get that it's a non story, but I, I you know I, I I'd be I'd be struggling to not if I'm you know look I'm I'm stepping into some heels and shoes that are are way bigger than mine. Um, I don't know how you don't feel some kind of way not having an extension because people make promises all the time, Drew, you know, and you know, there, this, this loyalty, loyalty is a, is a, is a fickle lady. And so, you know how you, you tell these coaches about your loyalty through your contracts and what you are paying them. So, you know, uh, I, I just, I would just say, you know, whenever you if you allow a contract to sort of a, a linger, you do open the door for somebody else to come in and really make an offer and really make it hard for the hometown team to keep her. Now, I don't know who that would be like. I, I'm, not, I'm not up and saying I don't know what open jobs there are in Division One women's basketball right now. And then here's here's the question. How high of a, we'll just say, mid-major, because it makes no sense for her to go to another, to, we, let's be real, y'all, SWAC is considered lower major, so it makes no sense for her to go to another lower major conference. How high of a mid-major can she go to and be a head coach? Because if she gets anything at the P the power level is probably not going to be as a head coach initially. And I say probably there's always somebody who may take a flyer. Uh, we saw, which, we saw Colorado be, take the flight. We saw Colorado take the fly with Dion. That would be criminal drew. And, and, and here's why when you've had the five year success and, and just the three year success that she's had miss me on that because it's an HBCU. We've seen people elevate, into power fives with less. We have. But how We've seen but it how many of them people look like us I, and came again, from our situation. Again, again, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Miss me with that, though. Don't tell me if I'm Tamika Reed, don't tell me that I can't coach at the power five level when you see these coaches get jobs, whether you want to say it's because of their look and their, and their complexion and all that stuff. Miss me on that. What she has done over the past three to five years, okay, is historic and dominant. She's built a program. She's built a dominating team. And it's, it's hey, it's worthy of being considered, even if it's a lower level power five, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there, there are even levels to the power five game, right? But even if it were a lower level power five program, it still should be like, Hey, if your program has been bad for the last three, four, five years, or maybe a decade, why wouldn't you contact Tamika Reed? Who's been a winner at her level and see right. if, see if she can trans transform your program the way 
you know, in, in, in the fashion that what she's done at Jackson State. So I I, I just say that. As, a, as an HBCU fan, I hope they're not making those phone calls. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident that she's going to remain at uh, Jackson State. And like I said, I believe this is a non-story, but, you know, we, we, we had to touch on it. Yeah. Um, yes. I do want to uh, make – uh, can I speak on a couple – speaking on the coach, Brian, before we go? No, no, no. Let, hold on, hold on. Oh. Because we didn't finish okay. talking about uh, – we didn't mention Norfolk State's men. We didn't mention okay. their, their their win. We we Before we get into talking about um, those those coaching things that we talked about, I, I just we, we just need to make take a second because we did talk about the women, you know, uh, A&T and Grambling and stuff. But we got to give mention uh, to these guys. Um, Norfolk State. Norfolk State Spartans, um, who finished uh, their season with a with a win in the uh, CIT tournament. Um, you know, Norfolk State. I think what day was this game? Was this Wednesday? This was the day That's after this the Langston. Wednesday. Yes, yes. This yeah. Was so this was the day after the Langston uh, NAIA championship game. Um, after beating Alabama A and M, I think it was Saturday in what was sort of a semifinal, national semifinal game. Um, They ended up playing Purdue-Fort Wayne in the championship game, actually hosting that game. Uh, That game was on Wednesday. And uh, Norfolk State was down as high as 18 points. If I'm not mistaken, Norfolk State hadn't lost at home all season. Right. They were down 18 in the first half. They were 18 at the half. You boy, trust me. Your boy now, saw now, I don't know if it was at the half, it was in the first half. I don't know well, what it, it was. No, no, it, it was it was it was, it it was, was at, at the half. half. I okay. believe it was at the half because guess what, your boy? You know what I did in game, right? You know what I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> because because Drew, hey, it was like plus 300 for Norfolk State to win the game. And I said, there's no way Norfolk State's at home. This is the best Norfolk State's unbeaten at home. Heck yeah, I'm playing Norfolk State on the money line. Sure enough, it came home for you, boy. Um, Norfolk State gets the win. Um, uh, what was that final score? Uh, t- 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 hold on, I had the box score in here pulled up. Uh, Norfolk State, final score, uh, 75 to 67. They were down 10 at the half, but 18 at one point. They were down 10 at the half, 18 at one point. Um, Managed to get the win, outscoring their opponent 44 to 26 in the second half. Um, they got uh 17 points from Christian Inns. Um uh Alan Bertrand added 16 points. Uh Jelani Darden added 11. Jamari Thomas added 10. Uh the Spartans finished the season with 24. And 11, uh, yes, I agree with you, Chuck Hunt. Norfolk State is a basketball school. Yes, they are. Um, they would be number one on my list. If I had a top five basketball schools, Norfolk State would be number one. And uh, this past year, I think Norfolk State, uh, when I went and looked at the records, Norfolk State played 34 games this year which, no, excuse me, they played 35 games, which is the second most in program history as a Division I program. Of course, don't forget, Norfolk State uh, spent some time as a Division II school and very successful. Spent all there. of their time as a Division II school. Yes, yes. Uh, so See, 35 I games, like. yeah, 35 games is the most, second most in program history. And the 24 wins that they got this year are the second most as a Division I program. So congratulations to uh, Coach Jones, who they, they they too had a contract seat. That's what I'm saying. If you're, if you're a, uh, if, you know, Norfolk State, even with all the overtures from other schools, what did Norfolk State do? They offered them extension. They, they, they came with the money. You know, they came, they came with the money. So, Anyway, um, congratulations, Coach Doan. Congratulations, Norfolk State, on getting the win in uh, the CIT. Now, 
hot, this is the hot debate. Rank your now again. We haven't finalized our BCSN rankings, but rank your one, two, three. And I know Dr. Cavill's got a poll that he does. That'll be interesting to see. But the poll debate, I think, is between Norfolk State, who what finished with a championship, Grambling, who won the SWAC and got a win in the uh, NCAA tournament. And is there is there a third school you you mentioned? Uh, who's the third school you mentioned? Howard. How you have to you you have to include Howard in the conversation. But the simple fact that they won the BAC and they beat Norfolk two out of three times that they faced All right. this year. All right. So so rank one, two, one, two, three. Rank uh your own personal poll. Because only one of those teams uh, finished their season with a win. Which rare oh. that, that's that's a rarity in HBCU basketball. But, but only season, one of the only only one of those teams actually got a win in the NCAA tournament, also. Oh, okay. But that's not as rare as winning and finishing the season with a win. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, come on. Who's your who's your one, two, three? Come on. If 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 I was voting in Dr. Cavill's poll, Dr. Cavill, I'm probably going Norfolk one, Grambling two, Howard three. Ooh. Okay. There it is. Um, I would be hard. Pre- and, and again, Norfolk State did win the regular season for the uh, uh, for the MIAC. Right. So and, and the debate is, OK, Norfolk, Grambling, regular season champs. Grambling. Conf- Conference champion, conference tournament champion, Grambling, NCAA, for victory. Mm-hmm. But Norfolk won what? Two, three postseason games. Two, no, two postseason two, games. Two, two postseason games. Mm-hmm. Two postseason games. So, at the level of competition in their postseason game, was simple. Was was similar. To the level of competition that Grambling had in their NC two A game, yeah. So, again, and, and now I'm reconsidering what I'm thinking. Now, now that I'm talking this out loud, I'm reconsidering this because I, I'm flipping it. I've got to give I, Grambling because I've got to give it to Grambling because of that conference championship. If if Norfolk had so won you're giving one it to the tournament, well, let's clarify. You're saying the conference tournament, tournament, tournament because yeah. again, Norfolk State they, did they, win they the regular that, season. That's equal. Both of them are equal on that. Okay, yes. I'm throwing that out because they're because yep. they're equal. So, right. uh, yeah, I, I, uh, because of that swag championship. Now, if Norfolk had won three postseason games. I'm definitely giving it. I would definitely lean to Norfolk, but the fact that they only had to win two, and there's no, and that's they had no control over that. But if they would have won three games, it would be Norfolk in my eyes. But two, I've got to go with that. I've got to go with that SWAC championship because technically, they both lost a postseason game. Norfolk mm-hmm. just happened to lose their postseason game in the BAC tournament. Versus Grambling, who lost their postseason game in the NCAA tournament, and I have to value that SWAC championship over that CIT. And, and, and I'm splitting hairs, Brian, because because if you ask me in the morning, I'm going to split hairs again and probably flip back the other way. <laughs> um, I, I will say, you know, you know, I've I've long said that I wish. I'm not a big fan of small mid-major, small slash mid-major programs 
playing the conference tournament because you run the risk of your best team not going to the NCAA tournament. So I I almost look at the, the I, I look at the in the, the the conference tournament as I hate to call it a throwaway, but I, I discount it because I don't the, the reward of playing everybody in your conference twice should be enough. But to have to go and play the third uh, three games in three days just for television dollars is. Eh. Hey. Everybody and, in the SWAC doesn't play each other, everybody twice because of the SWAC's unbalanced schedule. That's number one. So they're also, they're also, what is this? This is the second. So why time. play 18 games then, Drew? Why play 18 well, games? So, the, well, you we know, do, we know that, and we know that's up for debate. They may uh, reduce the number of games uh, next year. The they don't need to reduce it. They need to make it more, is what they need to do. Don't reduce the number of games. May, I keep well, hearing people talk about reducing. Okay, let me ask this. I keep hearing people say this. If they reduce the number of eighteen, what are they going to reduce it to? From 16. eighteen to what? To sixteen? Sixteen. Yeah. So how balanced is the schedule then? Well, th- you know, you know what sixteen is. Is that five? Six, plus sixteen one is plus sixteen is divisional. Five? Sixteen would be equivalent to divisional play. If you if you took if you took the same six and six that you have for football, uh-huh. you play everybody. You play everybody on your side in a double round. Right. That's ten, uh-huh. and then you play everybody on the opposite side once. Sixteen okay. games. Six, okay. Oh, hell, I actually like that. Now that I understand it better, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I do saying, like that. I actually like that. that. It, okay, I'm sorry. That I actually like it that. actually makes sense. It, nah, I don't know if they really actually want to technically call them divisions, but. Without calling them divisions, if you take that format, that's the formula. Okay, so now that you do that, then in the conference tournament, everybody needs to go to the conference tournament. Then now, that's a totally, now different, that, that's a totally now, different debate. Aha, uh-huh, aha, uh-huh. see, there you go. The conference oh, if tournament, you, if you wanted my opinion, uh, sure, we got it. I, sure, show, sure. yeah, come on. Okay, if you take everybody, top four get a buy. Yep, they, they go to the neutral sites. Yep. You you have five through twelve play on campus. Bingo. And, yep. and since you and since you are shortening your conference schedule by two games, you actually have the room to move your schedule up. So that what you do is that last, right now what has been the last Saturday of the year. First that's round. your opening. That's your opening round. Woo. You, you, your five through your the five through twelve play on campus. There you go. You, which which will cut it down to eight, uh-huh. and then you and then you still go with your third. Neutral. What is it? Thursday to Saturday, or uh, Wednesday to Saturday? Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday Thursday, Saturday. Friday, Saturday. Wednesday to Saturday, because now you've got time to you've still got time to do your travel. True. You win, should you win on Saturday? There you go. Not, the B, hey, the BCS Sports Wrap just solved the Swacks basketball problems right there. Yeah, now I don't know if that's what uh, the guys with what Doctor Clone is recommending to him, but if you ask, we hope so. This brother uh, here in South Georgia, that would be my proposal that I would send out to my uh, athletic directors and my president's council. All right, we'll we'll make sure to clip this segment right here, and then we will uh, rebroadcast this because that is a great way to run the SWAT uh, basketball schedule. Love it. Absolutely love it, Drew. Great job. Okay, let's get into some of those coaching things. You, you had a couple of a uh, couple of talking points because I know we're coming up here close on the close of the show. So let's make sure we uh, we hit a couple of those talking points on some uh, on some of those coaching uh, notes. All right. Uh, first of all, go back. First one, we I believe everybody. Should know. I've got to pull it back up. Um, Coach Stephen Joyner has called it quits at Johnson C. Smith after earning his 600th victory mm-hmm. this uh, this past season. He was honored at the end of the season uh, for getting that uh, 600 victory, and this comes from. 
believe this comes from the, the Johnson C. Smith uh, website. After 35 years as head coach of Johnson C. Smith University men's basketball team, Stephen joined the senior year of retiring. The legendary coach walks away with exactly 600 wins as recognized by the NCAA, the third most in NCAA men's college basketball history. After a stint as an assistant coach at Virginia Union, he received his first head coaching job position with Johnson C. E. Smith's women's team in 81, building the Golden Rams into one of the CIAA's most competitive programs. He got his women's team to his first appearance in the NCAA South Atlantic region in 85. Uh, yeah, yeah. After, after compiling an 82 and 72 record with the women's team, Joyner took over as the Benz head coach in 87. For nearly three decades, he has taken the men's program to unprecedented levels. Uh, in his final year, Joyner claimed a 600 uh, win in an 80-74 win over Claflin on February 24th and coached his final tournament in Baltimore. Joyner reaching... Uh, he reached 500 back in 2015. That's also what they wanted to say. Uh, so congratulations to Coach Joyner on your retirement. Uh, three CIAA Players of the Year, 34 All-Conference Performers, seven All-Americans. Uh, so, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good career. Any comments on that before I move on? 600 is a nice number. It's a nice round number. It's a great way to uh, to 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 end uh, a, a coaching career. I mean, what what is that average like? You said how many how many years did he coach? Thirty. How many on the men's side? Because those six hundred were on the men's side, and actually, they said it was six hundred as a men's coach. So he's he 682. Him. So he had 682 total victories. Over how yeah. many years again? He did five as a on the women's side. He did 35. Let's see, 35 as head coach of the men's team. Okay. So, so 40 years total. 30 years. Okay. Um okay. That's about an average. I mean, just about 40 years is a long time. I mean, that's I mean, again, you're you're dealing with probably at that point two generations, Three. probably a lot of. Well, I'm saying, but you're talking about kids that you coached, you and then coached by the time. Great. No, I don't know if it's that fort. No, nah, not that really. I mean, because okay. ki kids that you would have coached in the first ten years, let's just keep it real. By the time you got twenty years past them. Brian, that, does the chance that you've coached a grandchild is there? Okay, maybe somebody off his first of your team. first or your first or second team and uh, 18 to that. Wait a minute, they may have already had kids by the time he coached them, they may have already had like a two year old. Okay, well, anyway, so you add 16 to 18, add another years. 18, that's 36 years, Brian. 40 years is a, is a heck of a heck of a long time to coach. Uh, and but I'll uh, raise you. I see your 40 and raise your 45. Oh, 45. Jeez. 45 years. Who did and 45 this, years? Yes. And this goes to Coach Robert Skinner from Albany State University, uh, who just completed his 45th season of coaching, uh, 33 at Albany State. And now, here, Rock, Coach Skinner has won over 1,400 games as a college coach. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Y'all looking at y'all phone or whatever. 1,440. Wow. As a collegiate coach. How do you do that? Because he coached three different sports at, at Albany State. Doing his doing his uh, tenure there, uh, he won 620 games as the women's basketball coach. Uh, let's see. Let me find the 
Okay, hold on, I gotta go back and pull the other article. He won. Over 400 in volleyball. So that's over a thousand right there. Mm-hmm. And the re- and the remainder were in softball. Mm. So he's coached, did the high school. I guess he did the high school thing at one point in time, Ryan. <laughs> you know, when you got the same coach for all your sports, for all your <laughs> women's sports, <laughs> go just from and, I, go indoor, indoor, outdoor. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh yeah, Coach Skinner, uh over 300 in softball, over 400 in volleyball, and over 600 in basketball. He also coached at he started his coaching career at Payne. Mm-hmm. Uh where he went 160 and 165 at Payne. Uh, is he in the uh, Georgia Sports Af- or Georgia Sports Hall of Fame? I don't know if the state of Georgia has a Hall of Fame, but if not, he probably they, should. Be. I know of the he. They do have a Hall of Fame. I don't know if he's not, but he damn sure should be. Exactly. I mean, when you when you when you put in forty five years, uh, uh, and now. Definitely, I I feel confident. Thirty three at Albany State. Yeah, thirty three at Albany State. I mean, that's but, but even Payne awesome. is still in Georgia, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And in, in the state of Georgia, I mean, his you know his, his name uh, he, he belongs in the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. I, I don't know if he if he's not in there or whatever the equivalent of that is. So congratulations to. Um, uh, not only the coach Joiner, but the coach Skinner on two amazing runs. Uh, so, sometimes when I hear stuff like that, I get a little jealous and wish I had stayed in coaching longer. You know, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm, 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 I don't know. Brian, Just you, you also have to be lucky. How, how many True. people get a coaching job coming out of college at 22, 23 years old? You're right. Decide, You're right. That, that part right there. Yeah. That, that right. Yeah. Yeah. Most people under the age of 25 don't get that opportunity at the college. You're right. Yeah. I didn't start until late 20s. So, yeah. You're right. Good point. Yeah. Good point. So, you have to you have to not only be good, but you have to be lucky in, in the right situation. Yeah. True. Very true. Very true. Okay. Um I did want to, you know, so the the basketball. Now, again, we, Black College Sports Network, we're finishing up. I know a lot of other organizations, um, a lot of news, other sites have put out their All-American list and their players of the year. Uh, That's something that we're working on finishing, including our national champion and top five teams. Um, You know, usually – Usually we have a weekly or even bi-weekly rankings. Didn't have that this year, but uh, this year we will uh, release our uh, our finalists, our champions, as well as our individual awards. So sometime over the next week or two, we'll put that together. We'll publish it, talk about it here on this show, obviously, like we do a lot of other stuff. Um, but now our attention really begins to move towards spring sports. Spring football is happening, spring sports, and it'll be a lot of talk about, guess what, our favorite sport to talk about, football. <laughs> um, among among all the other stuff that'll be that'll be happening. I know the draft is coming up. I, I don't I'm not anticipating Drew talking a lot about the draft because I feel like we're gonna run that same conversation and that same level of disappointment in hyping up the draft, which, you know, great. I've got, I've got a question for you, Brian. Yeah, go ahead. How much UFL football did you watch this weekend? I watched more UFL football than I did women's basketball. I'm just going to be honest. 
I did. I did. I, I watched I watched a great fourth quarter game uh between your St. Louis Battle Hawks. Don't talk to me about that game right now. <laughs> and, the, and the Michigan Panthers, uh, which I didn't turn on the TV until like the last nine minutes of the fourth quarter. Very entertaining ball game. Very including yeah. I saw a kid kick not one, but two. 64 yard field goals. Of course, the first one didn't count, but he it knocked the out. second one through, and that was pretty awesome. Do you know, Brian, that not only the longest field goal in NFL history, but now the longest field goal in UFL history were both kicked in forward field? Yes, I saw that tweet. I think and, I that. and they were kicked. In the same direction. Where they? I didn't know that part. I didn't know. Same direction. Yes, huh? same direction. That's funny. Was it Jason Elam? No, uh, no, no. Uh, Not Jason Elam. Uh, uh, the uh, kicker from uh, Baltimore. Um, yeah. Tucker. Tucker. Uh, something yeah. Tucker. I know that's right. the last name, Tucker. Yeah, but they were both in the same direction. Mm, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I did see a, a ridiculous... Fake play, fake punt that turned into a touchdown today in the UFL. Uh, I think it was Not by San today. Antonio against DC. San Antonio Brahmas against the DC Defenders. Um, they, they were about to kick a, uh, which would have been a, a field goal. They were about to kick a long field goal, and then it ended up. What? No, come on. Come on, man. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, get out of here. Get out of here, Edwin. Um, no, no, it, it was a fake. F oh, so anyway, the fake field goal. No, fake punt. Well, actually, did it start out as a as a field goal? Yeah, it started out as a field goal. Then they called a timeout. I think they were trying to ice the guy. Then it turned into a, a pooch punt. You thought they were going to do a pooch punt? It turned out being... A, a touchdown pass to a, a, a center eligible. So literally, a guy who's a center on the team was lined up far out on the left side of the line. He was eligible. Ended up finding his way running down the middle of the field. Caught a touchdown pass from the punter 30 yards down the field. And then what the crazy part is, the punter said in the post game, he said, when they ran that in practice, there's only one route. Now, Drew, it was crazy. He said there's only one route that he was supposed to throw to. That one route was not open. So guess what he did? He threw it to the guy who was open. And he <laughs> said, we normally never catch the ball, but he caught it and scored a touchdown. It's <laughs> the most amazing play that you'll probably see in, in the football. So I'm all in on the UFL. I'm all in. I'm all in. And I'm not going to talk about the four-letter but I hope that's no. on the top 10 because the 64 yarder was not on the top 10. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't name the players involved that one. I'm sorry. I, I can't not, a, they're not, they're not household names just yet. I'll tell did, you what, they you, weren't HBCU guys. Unfortunately, I'll tell you that. Did, did you spot any HBCU guys uh, playing? Cause during the times in which I was watching, I didn't, I didn't hear any HBCU names called that I was I, familiar with. I'm not saying they weren't out there, maybe on the line somewhere or something, but I didn't see any, especially any skill positions. Hey, again, again, I, me neither. Sadly, me neither. Uh, so uh, we'll have to do a scan of the UFL rosters. Uh, and, maybe that'll give me something. Yes. It, yeah, that'll give me something to do maybe tomorrow, and maybe by next week I'll kind of see if there's any guys um, playing on any rosters from any schools, but that'll be something. Um, can I make I a guess, quick I, last thing on the UFL, but I guess as HBCU diaspora, I guess we have to be DC defender fans because bridge ball is their coach. Yeah. Hey, I interested. Like I had someone ask me why Reggie Barlow was interested in the FAMU job. You know, obviously his name was up for, he, his name was listed yeah. as one of those coaches. That, he didn't know if they were going to keep his team. I would have been looking too. 
Well, that that and I, it's funny you mentioned that. Yes, that and the fact that uh, going from the XFL to the UFL uh, was a pay cut, really, because uh, there's an article that I read that said he made almost uh, the XFL coaches last year made almost about five hundred thousand dollars. Well, going into this year as part of the UFL, there was an agreement to take a reduction in salary. Now, there was it wasn't listed what that reduction is or was, but of the four franchises that came over, uh the only one that whose coach did not was Heinz Ward. I guess the I guess the I guess the the, the pay was too low for Heinz Ward and he was like, "Nah, I'm out." Um, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the other three former XFL coaches all chose to come over into the UFL with their, with their team. So again, um, all right. So one other question that I know, EA had asked me a question about the finances of Jackson State and Norfolk State in the NCAA tournament. Um, I I did not get a chance. Uh, uh, I didn't get a chance to look into that EA uh, regarding the finances of the tournament because the only thing that I saw when I looked into the finances of the NCAA women's tournament was that um, I knew going into this season, they had signed, or obviously they had signed a new television package. Um, so there was increased revenue uh, for the women's game. Um, so I'm still trying to find out specifically, you know, what, <clears throat> what kind of, funds and, and what is covered and, and what else. Uh, so, so bear with me on, uh, on that question and we'll kind of see what I can, what I can find out on that. Yeah. Um, I want to make mention of softball real quick, Drew, uh, if you don't mind, because I just want to let people know, obviously in softball, um, just some quick updated standings uh, in the SWAC and MEAC. Did you know over in the MEAC, did you know that Howard is currently 22 and 7 in, uh, in the MEAC? 22 and 7 overall. Now that's against Division I opponents. Um, I think I saw somewhere else they have 25, so they maybe have three wins against nine. On Division One opponents, but um, they're on a seven-game winning streak. Uh, they are sitting at eight and one in conference play, actually tied with Morgan State. Morgan State's also eight and one in conference play. Uh, Coppin State is in third with a record of seven and two. Um, so. Uh, that's uh, Howard Women over in the MEAC. And quickly, I can tell you who they have upcoming. Oh, they got Delaware State uh, this upcoming weekend. So that's eh, eh, neither here nor there um, <clears throat> for for Howard. Um, over on the SWAC side, SWAC's getting pretty interesting. Florida a and with a big weekend series over Bethune. Both teams went into the weekend tied in first place in the Eastern Division. Uh, Florida AM and m won two of three. So that puts the Rattlers in first place by one game over Bethune in the East Division. Uh, FAM is at 10-2 and two in conference play, 14-15 and 15 overall. Bethune is 9-3 and three in conference play, 11-21 and 21 overall. And yes, G-Boom... Prairie View is them girls. <laughs> they are eleven and zero. Prairie View is the Jackson State of uh, softball. 
Oh, stop it. Stop it. Don't <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm not gonna, I would never do that to Prairie View. Uh but they are 11 and 0. Did they win? Did they win the uh did they win the uh SWAT last year? I think didn't they lose like who won the SWAT the champ, in the championship? I th- didn't Alcorn it may have been. It may have been. Somebody, somebody, tell us. They lost Recap- in the champ. I want. I believe they lost in the championship game. Alcorn. I I think. Don't quote me on that, but I think okay. they did. Well, yeah. Prairie View. They're still unbeaten. Eleven and zero. Was all, oh, that Alcorn took them and should have beaten them. I can't remember. I remember that was a good game. Alcorn Prairie View last year. Yeah. The uh, next closest team in terms of wins. Is Southern Southern is seven and five, but Southern's actually in third. Um, no, Edwin says Alcorn lost in the championship game last year. So, okay. I'm sorry. so yeah, so um, yeah, all, Alcorn. Well, I don't know who. So who won this? Okay, see now, I, I guess I'm gonna have to go while I'm here in softball. I don't even know who won the championship last year. That sucks. Um. Here you go. Real, real quick summary. It was Prairie View. Okay, thank you. Right. Prairie View's won the last two seasons. I thought it was Prairie View's won the last two seasons. Nope. Prairie View's won the last two seasons. Alabama State won the year before, and this is all post COVID, post COVID season. So Prairie View right now sitting in first place in the West, unbeaten. FAMU sitting in first place in the East. All right. Baseball. Uh, Edwin. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, they swept Jackson State. Jackson State came to Tallahassee unbeaten, 5-0, and and they got served. They got served uh, a, a, a plate of Rattler Venom. And we sent them back home to Jackson with their tail between their legs. And so, you know, the war is on. The war is on. It's back on now. Uh, you know, I, I had already seen it. And so just expect for your timeline to be littered for the next few days with a lot of hate talk between Jackson State and Fan, you folks. <laughs> so I'm just warning y'all now. You're going to see it in your timeline because – you know, anytime, uh, anytime the Rattlers take out Jackson State, uh, it's it's liable to get messy in the streets. So, uh, yeah, I won't be participating in it though. I've I've I'm calling peace on all that stuff. Until I'm calling we, a BS on that, Brian. You 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 well, you don't think I can stay out of it? No, you know you can't. I'm calling. People I'm come, calling people BS. come looking. People come looking for me, Drew. I don't go looking for them. People come looking for me. It's so unnecessary, you're, but you're starting to get that reputation. I'm I had a great week this week. You know, I, I figured out when I don't tweet about Jackson State, I have a very nice week. So I, I'm gonna see if I can carry that forward into a second week. When I don't tweet about Jackson State, I can tweet about everybody. I can even get involved with Howard and Morgan State. I can even talk and laugh about that. But yeah, I when I don't comment about Jackson State, man, my timeline stays clean. So I I think I will exercise my right to do that again and see how long it can carry me through. You know, I'm just going. You know, can I can I can I at least like the, the tweets that some of my fellow Rattlers put out there? Am I allowed to at that, least like? That's them? a start. That's a start of the petty. But see, I don't. I can like it without retweeting it. And, and see, that's the thing. You can you can and like. Don't, without nobody retweet. knows if you like it. Oh, no, that's false. No, that's false. It still shows up. You see, I think it, at least it used to. It used to show up. Like if you liked something, it showed up in the timeline. Like, oh, this person liked that. I had to, yeah. I had to be careful yeah, about it, 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 I was like. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Exactly. Uh-oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's what bookmarks were created for. <laughs> I'm just putting y'all on it. Don't get in trouble. Don't get in trouble. Just, you just let y'all know. <laughs> Brian, you better take your beef to threads. 
Hey, exactly. Oh, well, because nobody's there. Is that what it is? Exactly. <laughs> <Nobody>. <laughs> Uh, nobody's on thread. That's no fun, Drew. Nobody's on thread. So hell, you know, we can talk mess all day. Um, all right, here we go. Baseball talk. Baseball talk. Uh, here we go. Yes, yes. HBCU band talk. Yes, yes. Uh, right now in first place, uh, by just a half a game, a half a game, Bethune Cookman is in first place in the SWAC East with a seven and one conference record. Uh, FAMU, after sweeping Jackson State, is in second place, 7-2. and two. Um, Both Bethune and FAMU won three games, won their series, sweeps. I think uh, Bethune played Alabama A&M. Uh, Jackson State falls into a tie for third with Alabama State 5-3. and three. Uh, Alabama State ended up sweeping their series over the weekend. So that's how the East looks. Over on the west side, how about Grambling? Grambling State sitting at seven and one in conference, ten and fifteen overall. Uh, Southern sits right behind them at five and one, eleven and thirteen. Southern winning three over the weekend, um, and uh, Texas Southern in uh, third. With a four and three record. And, and really, what's interesting, Drew, is you got so like Grambling has played eight games, Southern has played six. I mean, these are conference games. Texas Southern has played seven. So, I mean, the first three are so uneven in terms of the record. You know, Grambling with eight, Southern with six, uh, Texas Southern with seven. So, you know, the SWAT organizes the standings based on win percentage, not necessarily. Like how we used to look at, you know, when we look at a baseball standings in a major league, yeah, it's like you have that game, top one and a half games behind. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like, you know, I, I don't know. And and I always wonder whether these games will get made up. Yeah. Well, that that's the thing, Brian. This may be the first weekend in 2024. Well, I do not recall a game didn't rain down to the swag at all. Hmm. Really? Yes. I know every well, other weekend, somebody has lost a game somewhere in the schedule due to, due to weather, baseball and softball. So, or, right. or you've had to do some creative rearranging of the schedule to try to get the games in. I believe everyone got the games in this weekend. Okay. On their normal Normally scheduled day. Right. Um, yeah, they uh so, man, look at this. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the score of a game and you tell me the score. <laughs> I already know which one it is. Well Alcorn, was it the Alcorn UAPB game that you were going no, with? No, it wasn't actually. No, I, oh, I was <laughs> I saw <bad. laughs> I, I heard about that. That was uh was that Friday? When they did that to them, oof, it was geez. game. It was game one of the series. It had to be Thursday. Nine to three. Jesus, man. Uh, no, did I was they, actually. Did they, did they win? Did they win the series? Because I know they won Friday. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, did they yeah. win Saturday? Yeah. Now, um, I'm seeing. Now I don't know if this is a a glitch in the system. Well, actually, no, because actually they did. Let me see. Thursday, no. Thursday, so, Friday. Everybody was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Probably. Okay, so the schedule is somehow off because it shows the same score. And I'm looking at the SWAC schedule, SWAC.org, uh, and it's showing Pine Bluff beating Alcorn 16-4, to but it shows it twice. So I don't know if there was a double header. That's the score I was going to tell you about today. <laughs> that was the football score I saw. I just peeped on and saw – now, this is on the heels of Southern and Prairie View playing an 11 to 10 game on, on Saturday. So, great offense. Uh, now, what's the, is it great offense or is it just bad pitching? Pitching, yeah. Because look, Texas Southern and Grambling, 15 to 13. I mean, the scores of these West Division games are absolutely ridiculous. I'm like, is the pitching that bad in the West? 
I, I'm about to do a deep dive this week and really analyze and look at the pitching numbers. And I'm going to go in conference play. I'm not going to use overall stats because if you use overall stats, you're playing, you're playing power five programs and those stats aren't going to be good. Yeah. But, but you know, just traditionally, the East has been the pitchers division and the West has been the hitters division. Yeah, well, we see how that works out in the, when it gets time to the playoff, the championships, right? You end up with two Eastern Division teams. Right, or at three of the Final Four from the East. Three of the Final Four from the East. And it'll probably be like that again this year. I'm just saying. So, you know, we'll see. Um, uh, Monday, tomorrow in Baton Rouge, you got a Southern versus LSU matchup happening uh in daytona tuesday uh bethune cookman is actually hosting ucf at uh, their ballpark at daytona beach on tuesday uh florida AM travels to take on the university of florida a rematch of the ncaa regional game they played um it looks like on tuesday Jackson State and Arkansas Pine Bluff are going to play. I don't know if that's sort of a makeup game. Um, but uh, there's some other interesting games happening during the midweek. That's, that's a midweek. Uh, that's just a non-conference midweek because they're on two different sides. Oh, yeah. Pine, yeah, Bluff, you're right. Pine Bluff is on the west, so that's just, that's just, a, that's just okay. a regular midweek okay. situation. Um, let's see. Texas Southern playing Tulane on Wednesday. Bethune Cookman traveling to Florida State. Uh, let's see what else. And then the schedule starts again on Friday. Friday's big series. Uh, Who did I say was in first place in the West? Grambling. Grambling in Prairie View. Big series at Prairie View. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Alabama State travels to Tallahassee to take on Florida A&M. There's a big series happening in Tallahassee. Uh, oh, Jackson State coming back to Florida again, taking on Bethune-Cookman in a series, taking on BCU. That'll be a good series. So uh, that, that series right there will probably do more to shape the East than the FAMU Alabama State Series. I agree. Yeah. Because you got, what, two and three playing each other? Yep. Oh, one and three. Yeah, two and three. Oh, uh, one, one and three. One and three. One and three. Bethune's still in first place. Right. One and three. So if Jackson State can rebound and lick, and lick their wounds, those Tigers can lick their wounds, uh, from the uh, snake bites that they took this weekend, then they could actually vo- help vault Florida AM into first place. Or also between these two series, we could wind up with a cluster after this weekend. Yeah. Should Jackson State and Alabama State sweep, we would have a official cluster. Mm, can't imagine can't imagine alabama alabama state's coming down hey, good squad good squad but uh we'll see uh that's I'm just doing the math sport. yeah i'm, I got I'm just doing the math yeah just doing the math all right so there there's a quick look ahead um we'll talk more baseball and uh um talk more baseball and softball we'll try to do a little digging into the polls uh, you know, black line, black college nine baseball polls. Uh, take a look at uh, some of the softball rankings that are out there as well, and we'll kind of look, we'll we'll start digging into that next week. Sound good? Sounds like a whiner. Okay. Um, I don't have anything left. Anything else you want to add before we before we pack up the show and get out of here? And this may be a discussion for another show, but just wanted to bring up something that uh, 
Dr. Gaville put out there, and I'm pretty sure he's going to hit a little bit on this on his one of his shows this week. What are mm-hmm. the items that is that institutional athletic programs need to provide to coaches to have success? Hmm. That's a loaded question. It is. It is. Um. And, and with the, let's start with the basic money. Facilities. Well, roll, roll back, roll back, roll that back. Money okay. for what? I think that's a m- money, and then okay. Sub- let's go. Let's go. Sub- let's, what is uh, your let's, let's go. Let's go. Scholarship. One B. Let's, one C. Let's go. Scholarships. You you prioritize money for scholarships over money for okay. Let's let's, let's take money out. Let's take money. No, out, no, I think that no, 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 no. The reason I say that I'll take it out because that's such a generic term. I wanted to get a little bit more specific. But no, you it. can be specific. See, I see, I think you can be specific when you say money, because within the, the realm of money, what I was thinking when you said money, I'm thinking scholarships, correct coaching. Facilities. Co- facilities. I, Hold, hold, before we That's even me. get the facilities, hold on. Before you even get the facilities, Drew, I you got money. You said scholarships, coaching, and then the third thing is recruiting, because you got to be able to host these kids that are potentially coming to your campus, and you got to be able to go places to see to see kids, right? So, but on on the scale of those three. What's your priority? You know, is the priority scholarships for your kids to be able to be around in the summer? And then after that, does it come down to your coaching staff so you can have a full coaching staff? Or is it the recruiting budget? Which could you do more or less with? Interesting debate. Interesting question. I mean, I don't. I'm not going to, I don't have any answers right now, but I'm just throwing out the topics. Um, I, I like I, this one. I, Evan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, that falls under money, but uh, I don't know. I don't think that falls under directly under the primary question. Do you pull, pull, throw the question back up there again from that uh, doc asked. Yeah. So f- for a coach to have success, I, I don't know if having the cost of attendance on a collective, I don't know if that, I don't know where that ranks on the money scale. For I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you something. Go ahead. And and don't laugh at me on this one. Successful football pro, successful football program. Hmm. Because everything financially from the athletic department starts with football. Okay. I mean, look, look, look at, look at what we just saw. This NCAA Final Four, Alabama and Clemson, two football powerhouses, two programs who make buttloads of money with football, mm-hmm. and with their collectives and everything else, NILs. You know, they maybe they're investing some of this into some of their other sports, such as basketball, to get a competitive basketball team. Can 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 we can we rephrase or reshape something? Um, and I had a great conversation with Doc the other day, and I it has me when we say NILs, I don't think we people don't know what that really means. And and as it relates to the athletic department, because I think what the athletic department, most athletic departments can't don't necessarily control nil nil is a thing right it's a subject but it's it's something that the athletic department can 
put together and create to the benefit of student athletes and businesses, but they don't have any direct impact. All, you know what I'm saying? All they all they are is the middleman or the can brain. be the middleman. The they, they're not necessarily the middleman. They can be the middleman to introduce these athletes to the I don't, potential. I don't really think they're the middleman is the wrong way of saying it, Drew. I think when you say middleman, you think of, hey, I got these two people and I'm going to introduce these two people versus thinking of it as a bridge. They're the bridge that you as the business and you and the student athlete can walk across to connect with one another, getting from A to B and B to C. That's the bridge, you know? And so the question is, does the, so where can the athletic department benefit and do something with NIL? Well, by maybe publicizing, promoting, talking about this connection, which, for example, I'm going to use what Florida a m has called Rattler Local Exchange, which they run through a company called Influencer, which is a program that essentially connects businesses with students or student athletes, right? But the problem is, the disconnect is a lot of people, businesses, don't know about it, don't know how it really works, and don't don't know the benefit of it. But there are people who have used it, and those people should be your, uh, they should be your, for lack of a better word, your guinea pigs, or they should be your marketing um, example. They should be the ones you spotlight, right? Like, like, like the glaze donut. Uh, yes, yes, but but what you what you do with the glaze donut is you go to, um, Chris. Krispy the Kreme. manager Krispy. of Krispy Kreme or whomever put that together and you get them to talk about how they created and used the Rattler Local Exchange to connect with a certain student athlete. Or we have a our good uh our, our good Dr. Lori, who's a moderator on our Wednesday show. She has a dentistry and she has used Rattler Local Exchange to connect with student athletes for her businesses. She would be a great example to promote and say, here's a business owner, also a Florida AM supporter who used this exchange program, you know? And so that's how the bridge can be marketed. It's almost like, it's like this, Drew. It's like saying, hey, we've got, I hate to use bridges given given all the things that happened in Baltimore, prayers to those people in Baltimore. Um, yes. But it, it's like, it's like, hey, here's this bridge, which is a shorter route to get to where you want to get to. Let's tell you how to get there. Let's show you how to make it work, how it can benefit you, the business and the student athlete and how your support is helping our student athletes. That is what athletic departments can do, which I don't know. I'm, I'm at you guys out there. What does your university do? How does your university promote their, their exchange? If they even have one, if they have exactly, if they even have one, right. You know, yeah. now, yeah, and, and the collective thing is a whole nother thing, whole nother conversation. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But just just wanted to throw that out there. I'm pretty sure uh you know Dr. I love Dr. Kavir. He likes to have these uh the lectures with the other professors and sometimes before he takes it to you guys on the podcast. Just to get yeah. our feedback uh from us. Uh, via the chat before he takes it on the podcast, and sometimes we we have some interesting discussions and some right some interesting debates. 
Yeah, I, I would love to. I would love to break that down a little more. You know, I'll be watching the show this week to see whether Doc gets into talking about that. But I'd love to. Maybe you and I can both kind of write down our thoughts to that question, and then maybe see what we uh, what we come up with as what's important. And uh, I don't know. Maybe it's one of those questions that you know I can maybe I can send an email to a few coaches that I know. And kind of get their take and ask them what what do you think to this question? Um, now's a great time to now's a great time to do research stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, like for example, I saw was it on Carlos's show? I know Carlos recently had Dr. Jason Cable on the show Saturday. Yeah, that was Saturday. Yeah, and and by the way, if you happen to miss Carlos's show yesterday, you can go to the BCS in pod zone and listen to it. A uh, great show with uh, uh, Carlos, uh, Charles, coach Petway, AD Wheeler Brown. Um, but uh, they were getting into discussion and, Oh, I couldn't remember. Oh, I had a, I had a question about whether that AD should, I had to go back and look at the live chat and see if I can remember what my question was, but it was almost like a survey. Um, that one of those questions that you need to kind of find out how athletic directors think and what their thoughts are on certain things. Was I, was I, it was it about the money games? When we talk about scheduling and how to do the scheduling with the money games, because I know that was a big topic during that for, interview for basketball. Yes. Uh I I don't know. I don't know, but. But I do, but I know, I think, and I know Carlos's stance was if you reduce the conference schedule by two games, what are you going to do with those two extra games? You know, are some, for, a lot of, for a lot of schools, they're going to go out and get two more money games. <laughs> right, right. But here's, here's where <laughs> instead the, of coming in 0 and 13, they're going to come in 0 and 15. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but but uh <laughs> Jesus. With that said though, Drew, or worse, they do the other thing, which is they schedule under the division one level and just just end up ruining the rating of the conference. But anyway, um with with the scheduling portion of things, what are you going to do with the money that you get? Like I would love, I'd love to get a survey and find out. Like Texas Southern is well advertised and known, even though it's not like they don't advertise it, but people talk about it. Like the money that they go out and get for their games goes right back into the basketball program, right? I don't know if every school is like that. I, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to say, I know for a fact every school is not like that. So the question is, if your school is not like that, why is it not? You know, why is it not? Talk to the CFO. Or, or if it is, what is the percentage that goes back into the program? You know, if if you go out and get a hundred thousand dollar game against the University of Kentucky, how much of that hundred K goes into the basketball program and how much goes into the general athletic budget? Like uh Coach Petway said, uh he don't mind going out and playing these money games long long as he gets it back. Is it is that money yeah, from exactly. that that yeah, money exactly. game? Is that going to my cost of attendance? Is that right. going to my nutrition table? Is that going to a shooting machine or whatever type of equipment that I need for my program? Is that going into my recruiting budget? In those circumstances, like Coach Petaway said, he don't mind getting his head beat in a couple of times to do oh, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when it comes contract negotiation time or evaluation time, do do our athletic directors really look at your record and of those 
because you're below 500, how many of those below 500s were against, were money games? So and when you're so, not playing a money game, what's, what's your record when you're not playing a money game? Every so athlete, we, every AD does not separate those. We, we know this as a fact. I would love to, man, I'm, I'm walking myself into these projects that I'm talking about here. So we have the SWAC and the MEAC bottom. I guess it, let's just take the bottom third. Let's just take, let's just chop off the bottom third of conferences, right, Drew? Let's see. So we're say from, from, let's see, there's 33 conferences. Yeah. What's that? From 24 on down, right? Okay. And here's the study that we need to look at. We need to A, look at among the 24 of the last eight or nine. What is the percentage of games against quad one and quad two? Because I think if, we, if we're if able to look at quad one and quad two, those are most likely the games where you're going to go out and get some money, right? Right. Okay. How, what's the average number of games being played by these conferences versus quad one and quad two? A. B, what is these conferences' non-conference record? Right? And you might even separate it by looking at the top half. You know, break each conference in half. Like if there's 10 teams, 12 teams, give me the top six and the bottom six. So among the top six, the non-conference record might be higher than the bottom six. That's 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 reasonable, right? Um, and then and again, there may there may not be too much of a difference. Conference there might not have two right. Conference may only have two wins. Right, right. And then because I, I think all of those leagues, twenty four on down, are one bid leagues, if I'm not mistaken. Most of the, yes. I'd be surprised if I saw any of them with two bids in the NCAA. So now the question becomes, you know, after you've done that research of the, and then, and then take that and let's juxtapose those conferences, excluding the HBCU, MEAC and SWAC. And now let's look at the MEAC and SWAC against those other conferences and say, well, if the MEAC, why are the MEAC and SWAC? Oh, I think we also have to look at operating budget too. I, I forgot that. We all we have to look at that, don't we? We have to look at these schools and say, what is their operating budget? You know, like a school like Oakland University in Detroit can have a $2.3 million basketball budget. Do we have any SWAC schools that are operating at a $2.3 million operating budget? But you you have to throw, you can't compare Oakland to a SWAC school. You would have to compare them to two MEAC schools, which would be Maryland Eastern Shore and Coppin, because Oakland does not have football. And okay. your budget changes significantly based on whether you have football or do not have football. So you have okay, to compare them point. to a non-football playing school. Okay, so, they, okay, so there's another little sliver that we have to look at is football playing conferences and non-football playing conferences slash schools. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Man. All right. I just walked myself into a summer project. I, can I can I get into somebody's master's program if I can uh, put all this stuff together? Uh, just hey, asking Doc, for a friend. Hit Brian, hit Brian <laughs> up. Just try, asking for a friend. I'm try, trying to see if I can try. work into a master's degree or something before I go sign up for something that I might have already signed up for. Just saying. <laughs> you know, I signed up for something because I was feeling bad about myself and I was like, eh, let me let me look into this. And next minute I know I done filled out FAFSA and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is, I'm like, slow down, what's going on here? Where am I going with my life? Oh my like, Jesus. <laughs> I got calls every day. Anyway. All right. Uh, all right. That's it. That's that's it. All right, Drew, let's get out of here. I'm getting lunchy. I, I want do they still show the Ten Commandments on uh on Sunday night on on uh, ABC? You getting lunchy? I, well, I'm what getting it? hungry, lunchy, whatever the word is. I haven't eaten in a minute. Anyway, 
I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a minute. I haven't eaten since lunch. Is what I'm saying. I I didn't see that particular one when I was scrolling through today, but I did see plenty of Life of Jesus uh, type. Uh, Netflix had a show. new show on. Netflix had a new uh, one on. But how do you not have the Ten Commandments showing on Easter night on ABC? That that's like a staple, isn't it? Tradition. I don't know, man. I don't know. So huh. it's just, right. it's just one of those things, man. Hey, right. Let's well, pick up this show and get out of here, man. Yep. Uh, again, we want to thank Coach Chris Wright for coming in and joining us earlier in the show. Uh, we appreciate him. Congratulations again to the Langston. Uh, Langston Lions. Congratulations to uh, Norfolk State. Uh, congratulations to North Carolina a and women. Congratulations to Grambling State. All, all programs who were playing deep into uh, March. Uh, prob- I, I think this is unprecedented. I, I don't know if there's been a March where so many schools, and again, it was 12, 12 programs on three different levels were playing after the conference tournament actually it was more than that, really. Um, yeah, it was it was more than that, really. If you if you can if you count the number of D two and NAIA, but I mean, so if I did the math right, twelve plus yeah, almost twenty. There was over twenty HBCU programs playing postseason basketball. Uh, in the second half of the month of March. So, yes, I, I see it. I see it. Yes, I see it. I'm going to have to – well, let me let me add Texas Southern to my FAFSA list that I already filled out. <laughs> <laughs> since, I'm, since I'm already plugged in and got a code and all that, I need to go ahead and fill out my stuff ASAP. I hope that's uh, online, Doc. I hope that's online. Oh, he did. He said it's an online program, which is cool, which is cool. Yes, sir which is cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, go check out the BCSN pod zone, please. Um, if you like to listen to podcasts, download podcasts, go check out BCSN pod zone on Spotify, Amazon music, iHeartRadio, Google and Apple podcasts, everywhere you love and listen to podcasts. Uh, you can check it out. So, um, appreciate you guys checking out the show tonight. Um, thank you, Emmett. Um, happy Easter to everybody. Uh, I'm going to go see if I can find the 10 commandments on ABC. That's what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, any other final uh, thoughts? Don't forget to, uh, go and vote for Morgan. I saw, I see that we, she picked up 40 votes during the show tonight. So thank y'all. All right. All right. Yeah. Yes. So thank y'all for doing that. You have that short link link in there one more time in the chat. Uh, hold up. Do you man. have it, you have it handy? I got to put it back in there. No, <laughs> I don't. It, you you gonna have to go back and wait. There it is. Hold up. Huh. Um. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's don't forget out. Tuesday night, Doctor Cavill's inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central, right here on the Black College Sports Network. Then on Wednesday night, the ONG Strike Zone, we get into talking all things about Florida A&M athletics, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central. And uh, Doc follows up again with another show on Thursday night. Uh, and then there you go. That short link is right there. Uh, give give one more time the, the young lady's uh, name again, Drew, just in case uh, people might might have joined us in the second half of the show. Morgan Hunter, she's uh, originally from Notasoga, Alabama. She played four years of basketball at Tougaloo College. Tougaloo. Uh, she was a four-year starter at Tougaloo College. Uh, she's in her first year post-college career, and she's teaching, and she is trying to become America's favorite teacher. So let's help let's right, help her man. win that's that's hbcu to hbcu let's show her some some support all right all right 
And uh, that's shameful, Jeremiah. You know, I, I'm a, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that bad. Come on now, come on now, come on. But I am, I am gonna watch so I can feel better about myself and apologize and pray for the Lord, forgive me for my sins, Father. There we go. All right. So appreciate y'all. Uh, appreciate everybody for contributing. Hit the thumbs up and the like button if you didn't already. Do us a, do us a solid. As always, we appreciate you. Appreciate your support of the Black College Sports Network. Join our YouTube channel at MyJBN Online. Join the YouTube channel um, and uh, be a part of, uh, of uh, this thing that we're building, continue to build. 25 years of covering HBCU sports right here at the Black College Sports Network. All right, for AD Drew, I'm Brian Fulford. Thanks for watching tonight. You guys be well, be blessed. Hope you and your family have a happy Easter. Uh, have a great Easter Monday for those of you who are off. And for the rest of you, have a great start to your work week. Peace out. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Travel light, everybody. Well, holla. But you know, you stay on hard.